or not, here we come. Oh, it looks like we're live now. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's Conspiracy or Not, Here We Come. This is Aaron. I'm with Amy. And look who we have. We have Elizabeth Vey with us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about ancient technology, human civilization, high technology in the, in the antiquity. So um, without further ado, hello, Amy, and welcome, Elizabeth. Hi. Thanks for hello. having me. Hello, Aaron. Hello, Beth. Hi, Amy. <laughs> yeah, you guys are really close. So why don't you guys start off real quick uh, before I get into my news and views section. Um, I know that you guys know each other. Amy, you you told me a while ago that you, she's an old friend of yours. So why don't you guys, how do you, how do you know her exactly? And then uh, Elizabeth, if you would, just give us a rundown of your background. Well, uh, I believe we initially... Uh, met on above top secret yep that's where it was about, about, about a decade ago <laughs> oh really a decade ago yes okay. yes i think it was, it was i i joined ats in 2006 and somewhere within that first year bethy and i ran into each other and we just hit it off and followed over when I was banned from ATS and Zorgon was banned from ATS, we went to his new site and it's just been friends ever uh, since. Friends ever since, absolutely. Yeah. So go ahead, Bethy, talk about yourself. Yeah, Beth, give us a rundown of your education, your background, and how you got into the subjects that we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay, I have no formal education in ancient history above and beyond like humanities one and two in college. But what I do have is 25 plus years of studying ancient texts, particularly uh, the prophecies of the Bible and unusual texts like um, the Book of Enoch, uh, the Hebrew Pseudepigraphia, various ancient texts from Egypt, uh, like... Um, uh, the destruct the legend of the destruction of mankind. That's actually an old text from Egypt. Um, the Sumerian text, of course, and uh, the writings of other famous uh, Sumerologists or Assyriologists, like um, uh, legitimate, quote unquote, or illegitimate, uh, like for example, uh, Mr. Sitchin. Um, I I think mostly what my studies have been about. Well, it was a weird, what happened? Okay, let me start, let's erase that and start here where it makes the most sense. What happened was one day I was studying um, the bottomless pit chapter in the book of Revelation in the Bible, trying to figure out what the heck is a bottomless pit and why is it in this book? So it was actually chapter 9, verse 11. So it was Revelation 9-11. I thought that was strange. And uh, at the time, it was not long after 9-11. So uh, I, I remember thinking to myself that I need to find out what this thing is. So I went back to the original language. It was written originally in Greek. In the Greek, it's abyssos, which is, in other words, the, the abyss. Mm -hmm. And that's A-B-Y-S-S. -S. And so then I thought, well, I want to know what the etymology of this is because this was written uh, already 2,000 years in our past. Uh, was written by a fellow named John while he was in prison on the island of Patmos out in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Roman Empire had put him in prison. So I was trying to figure out what the history of this word was. And it just kept going back farther and farther until I hit like this uh, this ancient Sumer and a word called Abzu. A B Z is in zebra. Yeah. U Abzu. And I thought, why in the Sam Hill would a underground fresh body of water? Because that's what the Sumeriologists and Assyriologists claim the Abzu was. They said it was underground fresh water. Uh, why would that be called the bottomless pit and be on fire and all this stuff in the book of Revelation? It didn't make any sense to me. And I thought, well, maybe somewhere along the line, uh, it, it switched from its original meaning. And so what I'm, uh, the connection there is not actually a real connection. So to find that out, I did further research and realized that that actually is what it is. And not only that, that it appeared to be, related to technology. 
and uh, it's at the time the Stargate movie and TV show were popular, and uh, that started to dawn on me. It was I thought that was really odd, so I did some research into the Stargate TV series and movie, and found out that the original producer of the movie, Devlin, was his name. Um, had received a screenplay from two Egyptologists from John Hopkins University. Who had, they wrote it. He said, I'm not interested. And then 10 years later, he changed some things around and made it into Stargate movie. And they took him to court, of course, because uh, that was their own theories that they had written into this screenplay. And uh, the guy had stolen it. And was going to make a movie out of it without their names on it at all, giving them any credit. So they took him to court, and he settled out of court. So we have okay. no idea what happened, actually, in the backdrop of all of this. But apparently, it must have been pretty good because he settled out of court. So I'm thinking, why would Egyptologists put theories about a Stargate... It just didn't make sense. And if you've noticed it, what they call that predictive programming, where they, yeah, yeah I was thinking maybe that's what that was, you know? So I was, I was trying to decide if it was that way because they were trying to hide it. Because then if people said, I think I found evidence of ancient Stargate technology, people would be like, oh, that's a TV show. That's right. That's how it works. That's exactly yeah. how it works. Yeah. So anyway, that led me down this long rabbit trail that went all over the place. It, I ended up finding information in South America, Central America, even North America. We covered that a little bit the other day uh, that, uh, that I finally remembered the names of it. It's a, a Kiva is the name of the building. And the Sipapu is the name of the hole that's in the ground. Now, according to their legend, they actually came here from some other world through a little tiny hole called a Sipapu that is represented by the hole in the ground in the bottom of the Kiva. And I was like, that's weird. It's a round building. There's a little hole in the ground that supposedly represents this. This Well, if you study wormholes, they claim that the wormhole is designed. It says it's not designed, but I mean, it, it looks somewhat like an hourglass shape. Uh, yep. it, it has a real skinny, what they call a neck or the throat of the wormhole. And I thought, well, maybe that was, you know, all that was left was this residual description of the science of the science that was involved and that people didn't understand it or the ones who did understand it had long since passed on and they didn't bother to tell anybody else what it meant or it was sort of like they they had their own form of uh, secret society there and they just passed it on privately to the, you know, a few elders or something. But whatever the case may be, uh, long since and they did what it meant. Uh oh, I am echoing back to myself. Yeah, give me just one second here. Um, actually, I was trying to open up the window so I could check out the chat room, and it's just taking a long time for the window to load. There, I finally got it muted. That should that should take care of it. Okay. Are you, you still getting an echo? No. Okay. Uh, one of the things I did while I was on AT, above top secret com was uh, come across a video that had been made by a couple of Christian fellows called uh, Ancient Aliens Debunked, in which they at, uh, attempt to debunk the Ancient Aliens TV show. And they made several good points. Um, and I, I admit to that while I'm doing my, re my critique of it, but I decided to debunk the Ancient Aliens Debunked video and the reason I did is it was really frustrating to see scholars say the things that they were saying because they were actually us uh, they were deliberately not going deep enough into areas where they needed to be deep and just ripping things to shreds go way down deep on things that weren't as important you know if you were trying to uncover something why would you spend time worrying about whether a guy had a mustache or not? I'm not saying that's what happened, but this is an example. If you want to know if the guy actually, you know, like a murder mystery, shot his wife, then you need, why would you care whether he had a mustache or not, unless uh, that was part of the clue. And, of course, that's not the case in this event. 
Uh, for example, um, they decided to critique the, the ancient aliens uh, conversation regarding uh, Puma Punku, which is an ancient site in, uh, I believe, Peru. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Puma Punku is part of the Tijuanaku complex, but it's actually not anywhere near it. It's like a mile away. So I say it's not anywhere near it because they make it sound as if during the debunking video, they try to make it sound as if they're right next to each other, and they're not. Uh, Puma Punku is a mile away. Uh, it may or may not be part of the uh, Tijuanaku complex because they're they're different. For example, uh, Puma Punku is created from uh, andesite stones, or not andesite. What, what was the name of it? I forget. Is it diorite? No, di no. This was one of the things they were picking on, and they in the thing was that you're talking about this debunking video. Yes, they were complaining about the fact that uh, uh, George uh, Sukopoulos, the guy, Sukulos, with, Giorgio Sukulos. Yes, I think he's awesome. Anyway, uh, they they were complaining about the fact that he mentioned diorite and andesite in the um, granite and diorite in the video. But when I went and researched uh, those particular rocks, those stones. I found out that the stone that is present at the place that they were mentioning in the debunking video is actually in the same, it's in the granite family. So these two things are related. They're like really close to each other in um, on the most hardness scale. So I thought that they were just being real picky. And the other thing I noticed from my research was that uh, the tour guides were actually telling people that that's what these things were made from. Andesite and diorite. Uh, granite and diorite, whatever. Anyway, uh, the the point I was trying to make was that they were picking on them for uh, for, uh, on George Giorgio for mentioning the, those two two stones, and uh, focusing in on this uh, idea that these people uh, they had evidence that these people had um, uh, made the the people who had built the Tijuanaku had also built Puma Puku, and they knew because this document they had called Who Taught the Incan Stonemasons Their Skills uh, had evidence right in there from an uh, from a archaeologist that went there and studied the place and said, you know, here's a photograph of the quarry where the pounding stones were found that created the, uh, the uh, Puma Punku. No, that's not what he said at all. When you read the article, cause when you read the document, I actually went and got the document. The, the document says, this is a photograph of pounding stones found at Tijuanaku. It doesn't say Puma Punku. So my argument was that they're, di they're not being specific enough because, number one, they're two different kinds of stones. Uh, they use red sandstone at Tijuanaku. They don't use red stone at Puma Punku. Um, there is a redstone platform that the building is constructed on top of, but that is not the, the material that the walls are built out of. All the walls, and who knows what the roof was, there are that other, the other one, uh, andesite. And the closest quarry for that is over 500, uh, not 500, 50 miles away across a lake. And they would have had... Yeah, the Lake Titicaca. So, uh, the, you know, I thought, well, maybe they just uh, uh, gotten it confused and thought because he was talking about Tijuanaku that it, he also meant Puma Punku. But they're not. They're not separating these two places. That's like assuming that everything that relates to the Causeway Temple at the Great Pyramid is is exactly the same type of information for everything that happened at the pyramid itself, the Great Pyramid, that is, of Khufu or Chiaps or whatever you want to call it. There are two different buildings. There are two different building types. You know, there are different... Who knows the difference in time between those two structures? It could be hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years. We don't know that. And so the same thing is going on with the Tijuanaku and Puma Punku. You've got this huge span of time that could be potentially uh, there. Because if you look at the difference in the construction, those are two different types of buildings. They're not the same kind of, they don't have interlocking Lego-like blocks uh, at Tijuanaku, but they do at Puma Punku. And the, uh, the other problem I no, had. They do have the polygonal 
uh, wall structures at Tiwanaku, right? Uh, no. No? No, no. Um, they have just, it's it's really good. I'm not saying it's not a, a well-designed temple. I'm not saying that. It's a very interesting building at Tiwanaku. But Puma Punku just beats that thing hands down. I mean, it's re it's crazy. Uh, another thing that they did was they tried to say that there was a stone there that they had a photograph of in the article, the Who Taught the Inca Stonemasons Their Skills. Uh, he, the archaeologist had a picture of a stone there that was white. And he claimed that it was evidence of... Um, the guy who the two debunkers tried to show his claim it was evidence of them being dragged like they're that is if they were drag marks the white areas on the stones and they were from the puma punka stones and they thought that was evidence that it had been worn down from dragging and the problem was that that's not what the article said at all the archaeologist was uh, claiming at the time that the uh people who built uh puma punka we're using mortar. Now, if you think about that, you know those are two different civilizations. The Incans did not use mortar. They in the Incas all claim they didn't use uh, mortar. That that they that the, the buildings were already there when they got there. Okay, so Tiwanaku is uh, I'm remembering now is the uh, location where they have the Gateway of the Sun. Right. Which is uh, that image right there. Yep. Okay. I um, should be screen sharing. You guys should be able to see me. Yes. Yeah. And you All see right. on the. Yep. yep. Hang on. Let me just click my icon so that I stay on screen. And then I'll come back. Here we go. All right. So um, it took me a minute to remember, but this complex here was actually reconstructed. Almost everything you see in this particular image is a reconstruction. This is not the original construction. Um, these, the main uh, standing stones, the tall, thin ones, appear. Oops, sorry, it's going to download the picture now. I don't want that. Um, opened up too many tabs. Do do do. There we go. The uh, upright, the tall, thin, upright standing stones are pretty much all that remained, and everything else was put back in place by by. Um, yeah, I guess by uh, you know the government of Peru for the purpose of uh, you know making the tourist site right. So this is not the original construction. Is that correct? Now that part I didn't research, but what I I think it's interesting that if you look at the little faces on the walls, they're all different. Right. And some of them don't look human. Yeah, right. Some of them <laughs> do have their yeah. I mean, it could be that just a bad artist, but I'm thinking, no, that's actually something quite interesting, which leads me into my next topic. I don't know what happened. I accidentally closed the page there. Come on, open back up. So, um, Beth, you've been researching for something like 20 years, right? You've written a few books? Uh, E-books, but they're not current like I, since I wrote those, I have learned so much that I've changed my position on several of the, uh, <laughs> of my yeah. Now the main subject matter is the same. No, nothing has broke me out from that. But I've got all kinds of additional information. So, yeah. Well, it looks like we got a swastika carved in one of these rocks here. Yeah, yeah. Now is this is a. Correct me if I'm wrong. What we're looking at here, this is Viracocha. Is that correct? All that. Maybe. You That's don't know? A, I don't know. that. Maybe he's bearded. Is he bearded? No. Nah, well, this one doesn't to, look. To me, it looks like a pharaoh with a square face or a little a little gold robot. You know, you and I were talking, we were chatting privately the other day. Actually, let me just go back to that picture. I think that's Viracocha right here. That's the one I was talking about, that one right there, that right. square statue standing there. Let me go back to this other picture here. This picture here, you and I were talking privately the other day about the uh, the Native Americans and the Kachina dolls. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't that look exactly like a Kachina? Yeah, it does. It does, it does, I agree. Yeah. 
little square heads. Okay, well, if, from what I understand, this particular site at Tiwanaku, and I've got another little gem of information that doesn't mean much. It just makes you scratch your head. Um, I'll, I'll ask you, and I'll, I bet you don't know, but would you happen to know the elevation at Tiwanaku? Oh, it's like above the tree line. It's so far up in the, it, it's like a, a trees don't grow there. I have a photograph somewhere on my, um, God, I, I, it's like 7,000 feet or something. Um, gosh, oh, forgive me. I, I might be thinking of the population, but there's a sign right there at Tiwanaku and I've got a photograph of it somewhere. I'll try to dig it up during the show here. Um, it's 666. I, I want to say feet because it's not, I don't know that. I, I remember saying, it, it, I got this actually, you know, you I, 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 I have I have the elevation here. It's twelve thousand five hundred feet. Yes, way the heck up there. All right. Well, I snapped a photograph, and I, I it might have been on one of the Brian Forrester videos where he was standing next to the Tiwanaku sign as you enter into the town, and maybe it's maybe it's the population. I don't know, but I swear to God, I was like, wait, what? It was six hundred and sixty-six. Now you anyway, see those. Right. You anyway. see those you see the H stones in the picture there on the right. Yeah, hand that's side? that's Puma Punku. Yeah, and they are nothing like the stones that are at Tiwanaku. They're not right. the same material. Right, right. Uh, they're, they're they're quarry is fifty miles away. Uh, I mean, to claim that the pounding stones for the red sandstone quarry are evidence that the stones that Puma Punku was built with were built with pounding stones is stupid. Yeah, it's that's not even that's the same quarry. Yeah, that's absolutely retarded. Absolutely. I know, and uh, this guy, one of the two men, is an excellent scholar. I mean, the dude knows several ancient languages. He's got like a doctorate and a master's, and he's brilliant. Otherwise, I was like so disappointed. I was one of his fans, and I was really disappointed to see him doing or being part of an uh, of a series that didn't actually do their research. So this standing stone here called the the um uh, with the gateway of the sun here. That's not sandstone, right? Oh, I mean, you know what? I'm not sure what the material is of that. Because, I mean, this is this is Tiwanaku. I can't. I probably have heard what the material is. I just don't know what it is. Um, it, it, that part, now, see, that's the, I'm not really that's not. That's not sandstone. That looks like the same material at Puma Punku. Yeah, that, that would be. Uh, andesite. I believe that's what's had Puma Punku andesite. <laughs> anyway, um, the other thing that they had talked about on the on the video that I was really disappointed in was uh, the one about the Mahabharata. There is actually a section in the Mahabharata that talks about an extraterrestrial battle in, in the space above the planet. Uh, but what they did was they went to these two in the video, they went to research that was done on uh, Vimyanas or Vimanas, mm -hmm. however you want to say it. And uh, they claimed that that material, the Vimyanas, come from newer texts that, that were supposedly channeled and therefore it's not evidence of anything. And they tried to poo poo the entire extraterrestrial hypothesis presented by the Ancient Aliens TV show as regards um, the ancient Hindu texts by pointing to that. And if you, I'm like, okay, just go to the Mahabharata then. You just, Mahabharata, 4000 BC. Yeah, the ancient Sanskrit was written in Sanskrit, okay? This is the old text, very old. And in there it talks about, they don't call them Vimyanas, they call them cars, like, a, like the car you drive down the street your motor engine driven car. They call them cars. I don't know why they call them that, but that's what they're called. And uh, they're flying. They're like, they fly. They're not normal cars that you drive down the street. They actually are airborne. And in this example, uh, there was a big battle going on. Uh, one of these quote unquote gods is fighting with uh, there's one in the sky, and he's fighting with the guy on the ground. The guy on the ground is using some kind of a weapon that can seek out heat. It has heat-seeking properties. And the guy in the sky 
has cloaking technology. And he cloaks his spaceship. I mean, it. It when I read that, it was like re. It was like watching an episode or a, a Star Trek movie. I don't know if you remember, but in uh, the <clears throat> Undiscovered Countries, the Star Trek movie Undiscovered Country, the Klingons uh, use a cloaking technology and start shooting at the uh, Enterprise, and Kirk uh, has Doc and Spock. Bones and Spock get together and go and solve this problem by loading a, a heat-seeking, or not a heat-seeking, but something similar to that uh, torpedo into the torpedo bay. And it, apparently what it did was it would, it could recognize the signature of the emissions from the quote-unquote tailpipe of the Klingon ship. And that's what this guy did. He, he doesn't say he was seeking out the emissions from the tailpipe of the ship, but it could actually... Uh, locate you, this cloaking, this cloaked ship that was flying through the sky. And you and you and you're saying that this is a, a part of the story in the Mahabharata. Exactly, and it was written in 4000 BC, way before the, it's the channeled Vimyana text. So, uh, and again, they were not doing their due diligent research when they when they did their. They did some really good work. I'm not saying it was all bad, but the parts that they didn't do a very good job on were. It was. I was disappointed. Hey, that's cool looking. So, is it me or does that thing look hollow? I mean, you certainly, you know, we can't see exactly inside, but just sort of by the way it's laying there, does it kind of looks hollow ish? It, it looks like it could be. What the heck and is it? it but uh, apparently, it's a pillar that has fallen over, a pretty darn tall one, it looks like. And there's a guy there with. Apparently, what looks like a machine gun, making sure nobody gets too close. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Um, it does appear to be a little bit on the hollow, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah, I it, I agree. I agree. It does look like perhaps it is. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I don't know if I'm rambling a little too fast, but I just wanted to say that these are topics that are covered in the Ancient Aliens debunked video, which I disagree with um, in occasion, on occasion. Like uh, they didn't do their due diligence on uh, the, the stones, the pounding stones, the drag mark theory. Um, they claim that uh, researchers went out there and... Uh, Crafted an andesite stone with nothing but pounding stones at the andesite quarry and floated it across the lake, Lake Titicaca, on their little boat. And so, what bothered me about that is that meant that they had contaminated the entire quarry because they went there and, you know, they were tramping all over the place, making their own pounding stones. You don't do that in an archaeological site. What the hell are they doing? Excuse my language. No, you can swear around here. We don't mind. We can take it. <laughs> I was just, yeah. You know, I was, you know, I was watching that video that you sent me today, the Brian Forrester video. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he did cut. He, he did cover those pounding stones on a on a couple of occasions as he was walking around filming. Yeah. And um, you know what occurred to me that uh, all of those pounding stones are almost identical in s s relative size. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, you know, those things might actually be projectiles. Yeah, it might be something else, yeah. Like projectiles, like trebuchet projectiles. Yeah, this is this where we right, right. you know? Yeah, this is where we make our, our grenades over here. You know, I mean, because <laughs> yes. if you were going to hurl, you know, a ball you know, a stone ball or something. You want that thing to hold together and do some damage and not shatter when it hits something, right? Right. So you'd right. make it out of a hard material. Right. And those things are almost all identical in size, which leads me to think, well, could be a cannonball, a crude cannonball, you know, could be, you know, trebuchet projectiles and not, could be. not yeah. pounding stones. And if it was a pounding stone, you'd have to hold it by hand. There's no handle. There's nowhere to put a handle. I mean, how were they attached? You know what I mean? They're, yeah. I, I don't. They don't make sense pounding. as pounding balls in any sense of the word. And in fact, no. 
even on the uh, Brian Forrester video where he goes down inside of the unfinished uh, obelisk, the uh, cavern or the walkway, the, the cut marks on the sides of that thing are so narrow that you don't have any room to swing a pounding ball. In fact, I'm going to pull that video up in just a minute. I might have it here somewhere because uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about in that video that he highlights. There he is. I'm going to do a screen share again. And uh, da, 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 da. come on, come on, let's do it. Okay. Hi, Brian. Okay, now I'm just going to have to jump around here. I didn't mark these down. I didn't take notes on this, a two-hour video. I didn't mark exactly where he was when he was walking around in the unfinished pyramid. I mean, the unfinished obelisk. But there are some interesting marks in the uh, in the cut marks on the sides of that thing. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen if I jump around too fast. Error occurred. Please try again later. Okay. So I'll have to pull that video up again in a minute and try to find it. Sorry about that. There are these scallop marks that just don't look like they were made by pounding stones either. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yep. And it, look, I'm a contractor and, and, you know, I work with tools. I work with hammers and chisels and do all kinds of things. Um, the high spots on these scallop marks are an obvious target for anybody with a pounding stone. You uh -huh. wouldn't have scallop marks. They just wouldn't happen with a yeah. pounding stone because any high spot is a target. That's easy prey right there. You knock off a big piece. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There is another gentleman that has a lot of videos on the subject of this kind of subject and he was showing videos from uh, uh, Peru um, particularly the Inca's handiwork in um, I don't know if it was a little city or something there the streets were lined with their their masonry and one wall was different than the other you could tell uh, also how far down the wall was the larger the stones get and it would go from being obviously built by the Spanish mortar stones that had been slapped together with mortar you know versus these great big megalithic rocks that are all put together like jigsaw puzzle pieces to keep them earthquake proof and you're looking at that going holy crap and then he shows this guy shows I'm pretty sure you know who this is. His name is Charles Koss, K-O-S. Uh, no, I've not heard that name. Oh, Amy likes him. And uh, anyway, yeah, he's he's a he's got a very interesting YouTube channel. Yes, he does. Anyway, he shows a, a photograph of one of the corners in one of these alleyways that uh that have been built with these long rows of these stones, and. One of the big megalithic rocks is is open, like it's been cut open, and there are smaller stones inside, and they've all been set in concrete. And he he has a theory that that's why they look the way they do. That they were actually originally uh, created from like a liquid concrete, and then they fill they put stones inside there of different sizes to fill it out. Yeah, we're going to get to that. That's the video that I sent you. Are you talking about? No, but uh, that okay. was, uh, he was showing, uh, this guy is somebody else who verifies, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the video that you sent me. I oh, mean, okay. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 what we're looking at when we say ancient advanced technology, we're not necessarily, and I put that in quotation marks, right. talking about extraterrestrials. They could be uh, terrestrials that are just recovering from a rebooted uh, civilization in which the, you know there was this huge catastrophe that it was uh, you know like the Ice Age or something, um, and and they're just hiding that information from us because. Uh, Maybe they do that on purpose, like every so many thousands of years, they reboot all the civilizations and start over. So what we're looking at here, I think this is the location at the uh, unfinished pyramid. Yeah. Looking yeah. Down, there, there's some of the scallop marks on the ground. There are some of these pits. Yeah, where it looks like it was liquefied stone and they just dug it out. 
and yeah, scoop. there's a there's a little pounding stone that they got laying down in there. I'm sure that's a plant. And it, um, it looks just like that uh, segmented worm body, just like that uh, wall in uh, Peru. So, and just to, I'm just going to let this roll because if I try to jump around in the video too much, it'll, it'll, you know, give me an error and I'll have to start over again. <laughs> so, um, I know for sure that he's standing in the, uh, on the outskirts, just right there at the unfinished obelisk. Yeah. As so, one? Um, Is that, are they at as one? Yeah. Yeah. And there it is, right there. Yeah. So I think this is where he goes down in the in between. So that narrow passage on the outsides is what I was saying earlier. There's not, you know, this is the video that you sent me, and there's just simply not enough space. And look, it's already got sharp corners. <laughs> I mean, they did a pretty damn good job with those pounding stones, and you can see the scallops there. Yeah, yeah. Just a second, I'll try to pause it in a good spot here. Yep, in there. Yep. There's some scalloping on the surface there. Yep, now that's yep. what I was talking about. That those high spots are are their absolute target for anybody with a, a hammer or a pounding stone. If that's how you're working the material, that that pointy thin high spot is a target for removal. Absolutely, it's an easy prey. Yeah. So this is a, an effect you absolutely would not get with pounding stones. Just pure and simple. And I, I say that as a guy, as a contractor who has. We've done a lot of chiseling right there. Look at those scalloping in, yep, the, in that, yep. in that yep. channel. Yep. See those little point on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, those little pointy high spots. There's just no freaking way pounding stone. Somebody slamming a damn rock is going to leave that little pointy high spot. There's just no way. Yeah, it's, it's liquefied stone. They were scooping it out like ice cream or butter. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They, absolutely. That I agree. So, do you, did you get the section? Did you get to the section of the video where he talks about the uh, black granite that was just? Uh, yeah, just, I, I've, I skipped forward because I just wanted to get to this since we had already started talking about it. I can jump back. No, way. you don't have to go back there. I just wanted. I just mentioned that because I, I thought you would find that interesting. That's why I linked it to you. No, it's very interesting. In fact, I, I jump back and it'll be rolling up on us in just about a minute here. Yeah. Um, that where where he picked up that piece of black granite and crumbled it in his hand, yeah. and, but the stone that he was looking at. See, they didn't mention the uh, the concrete that you and I, you know, in that other video that I sent you. Uh huh. He they were just you know baffled at why it was decomposing from the inside out. And right? there, and if you look at it, not only is it the black granite, but the the uh, red granite is sloughing off. It's coming off in little pieces and layers off the top, like uh -huh. uh, like uh, they what's it called? Uh, the stuff that sloughs off the sides of the mountains and cliffs. Called scaling. Oh, there's a name for it. That's other guy. The scree. It's called scree. Well, at least that's what the Brits call it, anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's just stuff that comes off the tula. <laughs> That's another thing the Brits call it, the sides of the mesas and the sides of the... He was using that as his example for the Sphinx enclosure, all of the the uh, water damage to the to the uh, walls around the Sphinx enclosure. Uh, that's evidence that that whole area there is actually very old. Yes, yes. Hi, Tim, cutie. Um... Couple anyway. of seconds, in just a couple of seconds, that section of this video is going to come up. Yep. Here, here it is, right there, right yep. there. Stop, there it is. right there. That's the, that's the stuff. Now th they didn't talk about it, but this right here is evidence that the other researcher in that other video I sent you, where the guy was saying that this is concrete. Yeah. They, ha they have the mm -hmm. ability to pulverize granite, and then reconstitute it just like any concrete. And what we're seeing here is you can see the outer layer of the, of the black granite doesn't match the composition of the inner material. Right. So they screeded it on like a tr they like troweled it on when it was soft. And then they could work it when it was uh -huh. soft. And and that explains why you see the 
well, they call those little protrusions on the stones in, in the Inca, the Incan stonework. It's really not Incan. And even the uh, Egyptian uh, stonework. Like yeah, it's, right. yep. They, they were like, you know what I'm talking about? These little, little pokey things that stick out from the bottoms of the stones. Every so often you'll see like, they almost look like handles. Right. And, and have you noticed how the Incan stones are all poofy, like a pillow? The ink. Yep. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like at Oliente Tombo? Yeah. And you see how the, the stones kind of like fit together like in weird jigsaw patterns. And those are the, the polygonal shapes. Yeah, and then they have those little handles at the bottom sometimes. They'll have these little protrusions that stick out. Yeah. It's obvious when you look at it and you think about it, what would cause a stone to, to be poofy like that with these little things sticking out. And it's obvious that they carried it or done something to it while it was in a, in a softer state and it's hardened in the process in that position. Right. You know? And, it's and you know, what's, e what's, what's even a stronger piece of evidence for me, I think, are the cores that come out of some of the drill holes. Because yeah. even, even today in the museums, the cores, you know what I mean, talk about the center, yeah. the inside of the hole when they cut the, the hole out, yep. when they drill a hole in the rock and they core it and they pull that little round, you know, uh, cylinder out of the hole, yep. um, that they're, they're thicker on, they taper, you know what I mean? So uh, it, it's been suggested that they were set aside, that they were cored while it was soft. Mm -hmm. And those things were set aside, and um, and they sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, distorted themselves under their own weight while they were yeah, still they soft. Yeah, they slumped a bit. Yep, that makes sense like, to me. Like soft clay, they mm -hmm. were just tossed aside, yep. and that they were distorted. But that right there, look at that. Yep. That's that's not even the same material on the inside. Now, the, 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 there was a lady in one of the videos. Uh, she's uh, one of the people that you'll see sometimes in Brian Foster videos when he's in Egypt. Her name is Suzanne something or other. I don't know what her, I can't remember her last name. But she was talking about it. She apparently is a geologist or something. And she was talking about the differences between the outer layer of the rock and the inner. And she said that the stone on the inside has undergone some kind of a heating process. Yeah, okay, well, somebody's going to need to explain to me how that happened without heating the outside. Right, and she, what she's saying is the heat actually was centered inside the rock, and it caused the inside of the rock and the outside. But the, because it started in the inside, the outside of the rock cooled first, and so it crystallized differently than the inside of the rock, which stayed hot longer. And yeah. that's... Uh -huh. now. One of the other guys. I'm not buying that. Except they're not even the same material. Well, this, yeah, and the other, what the other guy said, this is actually evidence of microwave. Now, that was the guy that was with Brian Forrester in the, in this video. He was saying it's microwave damage. Um, I want to show you something. You have, um, you're going to I don't have a mouse pointer, so I'm just going to have to direct your eyeballs. Okay. Um, if you look down at the bottom where it says the timestamp at one seventeen fifty six, yeah, and then there's a slash mark and then two o four, right? Right. So right about above the slash, maybe where the slash or the number two, just trace your eyes directly vertical, go straight up, go about an inch, maybe inch and a half, and there's what looks like a pock mark. And you can see a little highlight in a shadow where a, right. it looks like a stone fell out. Okay. Okay. Yep. See that? See a strong shadow and a highlight right there, directly above the number two? Yeah. About an inch? An inch, <clears throat> yep. Okay. Um, as a contractor, I'm going to tell you that the inside material looks to me like concrete. And that right there looks like a piece of aggregate that fell out. <laughs> so what why would they not want us to know that ancient people knew how to make concrete well i'm betting that they don't want us to know that ancient people had high technology 
Yeah, but concrete's not high technology. It's just evidence that they knew how to make us, uh, like uh, the people in Mesopotamia in that same time frame, quote unquote, uh, were making uh, mud brick uh, ziggurats, uh, which requires, you know, taking something from the earth and molding it into something new that's baked in the sun until it's hard. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm guessing that if they open the door to adding things like concrete, they might wind up bringing in other things they don't want to bring in. Well, it would certainly it would certainly do away with the argument that it's evidence of high technology because they're how would they get a drill a drill go through granite like that using a stick and a copper tube when it's at when the one guy that Chris Dunn is saying that thing is spinning to so many revolutions I can tell by the you know by the grooves inside the hole how fast right. this thing is going and it's spiraling in so it's not doing what you would get the kind of the same kind of marks you'd get if you had a a copper tube with a guy on one side and a guy on the other side uh with a stick going back and forth well, if you've seen how they're claiming they actually made the core holes they're claiming it was a copper tube uh mm -hmm. with a stick tied onto it and they would take turns pulling on each sure. end and it would spin that thing back and forth and dig a hole in the rock and create the core drill holes and he's saying there's no way these are spiral grooves right which means it it, it bored in so rapidly that in order to get a spiral groove that means it was real soft and it was like one twist or two twists and they were in right so what would be the point uh you know because then they could just say well the reason why they were able to court that quickly is that the because the stone was in a softened state you know they had made it into like a slurry or a clay like uh mud and now they're we're building us uh, stones from it so there's something else that's missing there's a missing piece in there that uh, that's keeping them from talking about that aspect of it um <laughs> maybe it's because it's an industry i, I think the powers that be just would rather us scratch our heads and wonder and let our imaginations run wild like the ancient alien theory and oh, okay. they would rather us just be in the dark and not know anything and if they had their way nobody would even know the pyramids exist but they can't hide those things and so they've got to you know get around i mean it's almost like it's almost like the instance I think it was in 1837. It was Colonel Vice, of the um, who who was an um, he was an aristocrat, a British aristocrat. He was uh, also at one point a British uh, member of Parliament. He rubbed elbows with the likes of the Duke of Wellington and people like that. He went on an expedition in Egypt um, in the 1830s. And in his journal and in his diaries, he was bound determined to make some sort of discovery. He blasted with dynamite his way into the king's chamber um, uh, um, in the Great Pyramid. Howard Weiss. Yeah, Howard, Colonel Howard Weiss. That's correct. Yeah. And um, he, uh, they found, uh, they had already found David. Someone else had already made a discovery, and it was called Davidson's Chamber. And then um, I guess he, the story is that he stuck a, a twig or a reed through a tiny crack and he discovered that there was a hollow cavity above so he blasted his way up and they continued to find more and more of these chambers and um they named various you know named after his various aristocratic friends uh wellington's chamber and queen subway so you know chamber and um when they got to um i think it was elizabeth's chamber they he supposedly he's reported to have found um, a cartouche of Khufu that was painted, right, right. painted on the ceiling with red ochre. And this is now, at least among the re alternative research community, it's now accepted as a complete fraud. Now, it's yep. certainly not accepted under, you know, academia. Yeah. But... I've, I've 
already researched that one out. That was in the chamber above the king's chamber. It was like in the attic of the place. Right. Have, and right. it, they claim it was, it was a, the workers' crew from right. Khufu that did that. It was a quarry mark from the quarry gangs. Uh, and for some reason, none of those quarry marks were seen anywhere else in any of the other chambers. And what were there, four, five, six chambers in total? So, uh, yeah, at least five, I think. Chamber, chamber the basement. I, I'm only. But that was 1837. So that was almost 100 years ago. And they academia still rides on that. And in fact, if you look up, <laughs> pull up the uh, Wikipedia on Howard Weiss and then look and then open up the controversy tab. And uh, that's an interesting read right there, by the way. <laughs> Mm. That was the op one of the opening scenes of the Stargate movie was Daniel talking about Kupu's uh, Coop. yeah Kupu's inscriptions and how yeah. vice vice it probably a portrait. Yeah, I remember months ago before we even had any idea that you were coming on. I'm a fan of um, uh, Jimmy Church, Faded Black Radio, and uh, he had um, Scott Crichton on, and Scott Crichton has written a book called uh, The Great Pyramid Hoax. Uh -huh. and, and he speaks specifically about uh, Colonel Vice and the Khufu uh, yep. uh, gang marking. And he's he's and, always posting on Above Top Secret. That's how I, I read oh, all really? of this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I read his, well, or, his original research. It was interesting. Uh, Jimmy Church, I thought, made a really <laughs> almost you know a, a real poignant uh, statement when he said, look, if you're a pharaoh and you were building this pyramid, you're not going to have the only one single place where your name is actually found is inside an unreachable chamber on the ceiling by a gang of, you know, quarrymen. You're going to carve your name in big, bold letters. You're going to have, there's going to be no question that it was yours. Yes, it'll be all <laughs> You know what I mean? That's just insane. Yeah, absolutely. At least it would be in, in uh, uh, you know, there'd be a statue commemorating it right out the side of the front door. You're going to have your <laughs> face carved in the front door. You're going to have your name over the lintel. You're going to have, you know, <laughs> there's not going to be any question that it was yours. Yep. Um, yep. Then, there, there, of course, there's a long debate over if, if he didn't build it, then he the heck did. And... Uh, it, uh, of course, uh, people like um, who's the gentleman uh, who was originally the geologist that originally determined that the uh, sinks and closure was uh, water damage. Robert Shock. Shock, yeah. Uh, Shock um, was one of the ones that convinced me uh, that the building was actually pre Khufu. That either, not just the the Sphinx, but also the pyramid itself. And there, now this is an interesting tack. While I was studying the abyss, no, the the abyss trail that goes from the bottommost pit verse, um, one of the things I stumbled upon was uh, the writings by a guy. Um, his first name is David. I can't think of his last name right off the top of my head, but. He wrote uh, several books about ancient Egypt to call, uh, based around what he calls the new chronology. And what they're doing is they're trying to correct the timeline. Uh, right. Because what, what happened was at one point there was a showdown between Manetho, who was this, a scholar for ancient Egyptian um, antiquity, and Barosis, who was a scholar from Mesopotamian antiquity, they had a showdown to see who had the oldest civilization. And so Manetho brought out the, the king, the kings, all the pharaohs that had ever lived. And uh, based this on the work that was done at Seti the first building in Abydos. And Barosis did his on the king's list, the Sumerians' king's list. Well, if you look at the Sumerian king's list, some of those people... They claim this guy lived 250,000 years. One guy. Right. So we're, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, anyway, the, the king's list, uh, the pharaoh's list, which is uh, from Egypt instead of the king's list from Sumer, the king, uh, pharaoh's list, uh, what they did was they, lay, they lined up the, the pharaohs end to end 
when actually there were times when there were two pharaohs ruling at the same time. One would rule no, lower Egypt, the other one would rule upper Egypt. So it right. was, it, consider it like the United States uh, when it was the north versus the south, and you had two different leaders going there. Well, that's how it was um, on more than one occasion through the 4,000 years of Egyptian history. The ancient Egyptian history, I should say. And uh, I got off on a tangent there. <laughs> I was talking about the uh, the bottomless pit information and how that related to something you mentioned. Um, and Abydos. This, this happens a yeah, lot. Well, the last thing I was mentioning was that uh, we were talking about Khufu's pyramid and he was, should have his name all over the place. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's it. So this guy, he, he, he did this new chronology to, to, to correct for the errors of not mentioning that there were two pharaohs ruling at once on more than one occasion. And he discovered that the, you know how for the longest time they told people that uh, there was no evidence in ancient Egypt that the Israelites ever existed. It turns out that there's these people called the Hyksos or the Hyksos who were actual pharaohs for a while in ancient Egypt. They had come from the east. They'd come in, they'd be, they called them invaders. Uh, they became rulers and pharaohs. And then uh, they were chased out of Egypt by there, the new pharaoh at the end of their, what they call the Hyksos expulsion. And more than one person has researched this and said, that's gotta be it. I mean, even the paintings that depict these guys, they look, like the old pictures of the Jewish people with the ropes with the tassels on them and yeah. the, and, and the multicolor and, and they're they're paler skinned and they have curly beards and curly hair and they have goats and sheep and <laughs> I mean it's just like right out of the it's just it's ridiculous anyway here's a uh, if you consider that the ancient Israelites were the Hyksos then you get you have a, an anchor in ancient history. For your timeline and that's what is going on now we've got all this ancient history so he's he's oozing all over the place trying to figure out how all this ties together so he can make a really good case for his theory and he discovers that um the ancient city in egypt called abydos or abydos, abydos. Mm -hmm, there's people call it both ways abydos or abydos uh that that word is actually the greek pronunciation the Egyptian pronunciation is based on the way it's spelled in Egyptian, which is apparently um, something equivalent to A, B is in boy, D is in dog, J is in Joseph, um, U. So A, B, D, J, U. And the, the D, J is pronounced Z. So the word is A, B, Z, U. Abzu. Abzu. And I'm like, what's the Abzu? So now we're back to Abzu again. Yes, I'm like, what's Abzu doing over here in, 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 in Egypt? And what was the point of that? So I went back into the history of Abydos to find out when it started. And they during a, the Nakata or the Nequita period, I don't know, uh, depends on, I don't know if I got the pronunciation right there. Uh, when they were apparently invaded by... Mesopotamians. Uh, one, a group in particular uh, headed up by this guy named Emmacar who was the biblical Nimrod. And he's, he restarted, not started, but restarted the Pharaonic dynasties at Abydos. And that's why it's named after Mesopotamian. Uh, and, he, and he built this building there that Seti the first discovered when he was excavating there for his own temple. Um, a modern Egyptologists try to claim that that uh, structure that's there that Seti discovered while excavating for his own building, they're trying to claim he built it, but it's totally different. It doesn't have any hieroglyphs. It's made out of different kinds of stone. All these things. This is a long list of reasons why it wasn't built by Seti. I mean, the list is long. And at the time, Sir William, is it Flinders Petrie? 
Flinders Petrie, Sir Flinders Petrie, and Margaret Murray. Margaret Murray was a famous, um, like one of the first famous uh, female Egypt Egyptologists. The two of them were, uh, they rediscovered the place. Because for, you know, just like with the Sphinx, the place got buried in sand, and nobody even knew it existed for a long time. And they rediscovered this. The building is called the Osirion. It's named after Osiris, an Egyptian god. Yeah. It's underground, and there's no, there was no structure on top of it. It was a, just a building under the ground, and it had um, uh, huge granite pillars with no hieroglyphs or carving anywhere that looked very reminiscent of the Causeway temp Temple at the Great Pyramid. And so this is like in this, uh, is it the same timeline? I'm thinking it might be all related because why such a difference? I mean, the types of stone they're using, the, the lack of decoration or hieroglyphs, it's like two different civilizations. Well, I think it's pretty interesting that Abydos translates to Abzu and Abzu translates to abyss. Abydos is the Greek word, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm not, no, it doesn't translate. What I'm telling you is the word the, is the spelled. Etymology. Yeah, the word is spelled in such a way that when you say DJ, a DJ in Egyptian is a Z sound. They, they uh, like, yeah, but, but, but like Zosers, like but Zosers. But didn't you say earlier that the word abzu has its etym or the word abyss, the etymology of that word goes to the abzu? Right, it does. And, and that's, I'm, 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 yes, it's related, definitely. I'm just saying that it's not, you know, if, if somebody were to come along that is a scholar in the subject, they would say, this is, this, there's no evidence that this is the same word. Uh, it's not, it's not like the Egyptians wrote down next to it. We named this building after uh, uh, water in, in Mesopotamia. But I don't, are you familiar with Sumerian information? A little. Okay. Do you know who Samuel Noah Kramer was? Uh, no, but I've, I have heard the name Samuel Noah. Okay. Noah. Noah. Okay. Samuel Noah Kramer. Was it uh, three names? <laughs> anyway, uh, he was like the first sumerologist in the world, according to uh, the mainstream. And he was the one who first translated the Sumerian uh, QA form, according to mainstream. And he wrote a book um, called Enki and the E. Angura. Now, the E. Angura was another name for Enki's temple, the Aabzu. Now, I say A because it, it starts with an E. It's E period A B Z U. E F Z U, but it's actually pronounced A F Z U. The letter A, the E there is pronounced A. I don't know why. Anyway, the A F Z U was a temple that Enki built. Okay, now, according to this information, I, I want you to think about the opening verses of the Bible. And the Genesis chapter 1, uh, ch uh, verses 1 and 2, and maybe even 3. Enki raises the Aabzu up from the, the abyss and floats it over the water like a lofty mountain. And the Spirit of God floats over the abyss. Okay, so I'm thinking the abyss and the Abzu, these things are just talking about, you know, like, Sitchin was trying to say that Enki was just like floating around in a in a, a submarine or something and he surfaced in it. And I'm like, wait, that does, how's he floating it over the water? This thing sounds like it's airborne. It, it, maybe it was under the water and it came up over the water and it's floating across. So, I mean, what's it mean? So I, that was one of the things I was looking for, and it was in my in my attempts to try to understand the abyss reference. Uh, then I started noticing the the abyss and the water of the ocean are actually two different things, and that the abyss and the underground fresh water are two different things. These are not the same thing. It's the abyss is a very different place than all this other stuff. It's I, I'm like, what the heck is this? So, 
I did a lot of research uh, on uh, that particular subject, and one of the things I stumbled upon was the description of Enki's temple. It said, the outside was gold, the inside, the interior was silver, and it was decorated with lapis lazuli decorations, and it, the, in, in, the interior was a tangled thread beyond understanding. And I was like, what? It's just a building. Uh, you know, if this is a temple, how complex can a temple be? But he's claiming it's almost like a maze. What's a, you know what I mean? Hmm. Oh, oh, how do you put all this stuff together? I just could not figure it out. And it dawned on me that they were talking about this is some kind of technology, and, and you, you've got some human priest or something in there looking at it, and he's going, wow. You know, he doesn't know what he's looking at. That's why I, I say that there, there's lots of evidence for ancient technology because of the descriptions these people are giving. You don't think about it on the first when you first read it, but then after you look at it again, you go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is going on here? Now, was it extraterrestrial technology? I don't know. Well, let me just digress for a quick moment. One of our friends, Alpha Thelema, in the chat box mentioned that, I, mentioned that I wrote in the description that I had a curveball, and she said, I wonder what that is. And I didn't make it clear, but the curveball turns out that it's concrete. And here's an image, just to go back to the concrete factor one more time. Uh -huh. What we're looking at, this is Brian Forrester examining a large granite block. And uh -huh. as, he walk, as he walks around this granite block, he's examining how it's disintegrating and crumbling. Right, that's right, yeah. And right. he's saying, uh, you know, as he's filming, he's saying that granite doesn't behave like this. Even under intense sunlight and heat, it, granite doesn't do this. It doesn't behave like this. It doesn't disintegrate and crack and fall apart like this. Yeah, it's turning into scree. Now, this particular image that I've frozen on the screen right here is, in my opinion, what concrete does. And it's not my opinion. I, this I know concrete behaves like this. Old uh -huh. concrete. If you go under like an out in the wilderness under an old bridge, like an old concrete bridge where maybe they had to rebuild it and they, you know, they tear down some old concrete columns that falls in the water and it gets rained on and snow and ice and over the years it just starts to disintegrate it looks like this well this is my question yeah. if they're making it out of concrete uh well we're using the word concrete because it's our only frame of reference the point is they were able to pulverize granite and reconstitute it and work it like clay yeah yeah and if by any by some circumstance let's say this particular stone that we're looking at if you don't mix your concrete properly if you don't have the right binding agents or too much of one substance over another if you have too much aggregate which is the filler rock right. filler you have too much aggregate and not enough binding agent it's going to disintegrate it's not considered strong or high quality concrete uh -huh, uh -huh. so if this particular large block of granite that uh, uh, Brian is looking at here, if it was manufactured, if it was created with a batch of material that was mixed in properly and with not enough binding agents, or maybe their water was contaminated with too much dirt, then it interrupts the binding agent on a molecular level, and over time you get the scaling that you see on top, because you can see a couple of flat spots where it comes off in thin layers, uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. And then you on, on this big, rounded, strange looking crack that's almost, you know, in the center of the screen near the bottom on the left side. Um, <laughs> I know I just said center, bottom, left all in one breath. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you see this crack that I'm talking about. This is the way concrete behaves when it gets very old. Right. Now, this is my question, though. Uh, what technique did they use to do that? They could to, to pulverize granite to the point where it could be cement-like. Well, the documentary that I sent you yesterday or two days ago, whenever I sent, um, uh, the, the guy who made that documentary, 
he suggested in that documentary that they had dynamite. They had the ability to blast and yep. powderize the granite. Now, that's interesting, uh, considering uh, if we were to take the history of the ancient world, uh, the, who were the first people that came up with explosives? Well, we're told it's the Chinese, right? Mm. Well, have you looked at some of those pharaohs? They look awfully oriental to me. Not all of them look... Uh, uh, oriental? Look not, yeah, some of them don't look... Uh, some of, Not all, but some of them don't look uh, African or Semitic. Some of them look Asian. Yeah, they do, actually. They do. They do have sort of uh, not slanted so much, you know, the eyes, uh, but they are often depicted as uh, somewhat of slit-ish. Well, and there's, I've got a series of, I did a little research on that. I have a series of images where they look like they're from different parts of Asia. Like there's one that looks like he might be Japanese, another that looks like he might be... Um, Chinese, another little, one person said that that guy looks uh, like the people that live up by the t Tibet. He gave the name for it. I can't remember. Well, I've, I guess got, they, I've got a question for you. Maybe you know the answer. And I, I haven't confirmed, but I have heard that some of these granite obelisks have, you know, they've got these indention engravings, right, all, on all four sides. Um, I was told or I heard somewhere that those engravings, <laughs> The inset carvings on the obelisks are absolutely, absolutely identical. So each, you know, word or letter or, you know, shape or whatever you want to call each hieroglyph, um, that they are absolutely size and shape and... and uh, uh, like a print, uh, like somebody stamped it on there with a... Like right, a that's what I was going to say, because if... For instance, if they were using a granite type of concrete that they could smear onto a surface, like maybe they built that obelisk at a block, and then they smeared a couple of inches thick layer of this concrete paste that was actually made of granite, and while it was in a soft form, that they came along with a stylus, and they just made pressed it in there at like an imprint, then that would explain the absolute exact shape all the way around. So, for instance, the the, the little shape that looks kind of like a feather or kind of resembles Anubis's ear. I don't know what word that is in Egypt, but I, I think you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, it would it would explain why each one of those, as you go around all the different sides of the obelisk and all the different instances where that word in Egypt is seen as an in, in, you know an engraving or carving. It would explain why they're absolutely perfectly the same size and same shape without any deviation. If you had a stylus, uh -huh. yep. you were just pressing it into soft clay, you could press it in a million times and get a million of the exact same shape. Exactly. Without yeah. yeah, and that might explain, too, why, and this was one of the things that Dunn was using for his reasoning about ancient technology, uh, ancient high technology, um, the face of uh, one of the pharaohs and how it was symmetrically identical on both sides. Right. There's the, the, that's yep. right. the symmetry of the engraving or carvings. Like what we're looking at right here is a, a, a stubby, short obelisk. Right. And it doesn't taper on the sides, but it's got the pyramidal top. And I've got, I paused it where it's got a good look at some of the you know, carvings of, of whoever, you know, pharaohs or whoever's being depicted. And um, it makes more sense that this was a soft material and they basically molded and pressed into place into a soft material. They just pressed, they had a, a pre-made, maybe a carving out of wood, and they just pressed it in place. Okay, so what is it? Now, the other, one of the theories, and the Rosicrucians uh, talk about this, and so does uh, the gentleman in the video with Brian Forrester, what the possibility that it's, it's sound technology is what's causing the explosion. So if they're using explosives, let's say you do have to, uh, sound directed at a certain location, could you blow something up with sound? Like in the Dune movie, they were using a, a sound weapon. I imagine um, it's possible. Certainly is possible. Oh. 
absolutely is possible. I mean, because one of the things that the, he keeps picking up on, and one of the things that the ke ke chemistry people talk about all the time, is the idea that the uh, most of the stones that they pick that resonate at certain frequencies, and they do uh -huh. that, that they're picking that stuff on purpose for that reason. That's why the Egyptians are using. Go ahead. I'm glad you brought that up about the resonance and, and the way they vibrate because this image right here, the guy's got his ear against this one. And again, this is Brian Forrester's video where he says, if you pound on this particular obelisk piece, that it, it rings. And I wish I could get the audio to work, but we've had this problem for a long time. I can screen share and you can see the video, but the audio just won't come through even if I wanted it to. It's just been an ongoing problem for this yeah. hangout platform. Yeah. But in this video at this particular moment where the guy's got his ear against it and he don't you don't have to put your ear against it either. You can hear it audibly because it Brian's camera picks it up. Somebody's banging on it with their fist and you can hear the thing ring. Mm. So I watched this video today and I must have watched this particular clip three or four times. And I said to myself, that thing is hollow. <laughs> it, it sounds oh. hollow to me. Oh, that reminds me. I have to tell you this before I forget. Okay, Charles Koss, K O S. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, he does a video on the on the age of the Sphinx. He also does a video on uh, that uh, device that Charles Dunn is enamored with. It looks like um, a propeller on a boat or something. And they're oh, right. the yeah, lotus yeah. flower vase. Uh huh. I know what and, you're talking right, about. Right. Yes, the flower vase. Sure. And, uh huh. <laughs> Yeah. Charles says that is actually this is gonna be you're gonna like this. That's actually made out of metal. Yeah. And on the outside, they've layered, they knew how to liquefy rock and they encased it in this liquid rock that then hardened over the that would explain how they were making these beautiful shaped vases and stuff. All out of this ridiculous stone like schist, which is so brittle. It's like flint. If you've ever tried to do anything with flint, you know it breaks off in little sheets, mm -hmm. like my yeah. hair. And he's thinking about vase with a fluted neck made out of schist, really paper thin schist. And they're like, "How? How are they doing this?" Well, if it's not, if it's coat, if it's metal coated with with schist stone, it'll look like it's a stone, but it's really not. He's claiming that's what that was, and that's what a lot of that stuff is. It's just yep. uh, they learned how to make rock into like a liquid, and then use it to cover things, so that sort it sort of looks. paint with it. Yeah. So if that if that obelisk is hollow, <laughs> it could have been originally built out of wood, and now it's all covered in stone. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to feature the video that I sent you. This is where the, the, the guy that you see in this image right here, he is um, he's the guy who made the, well, this you can find this video on Zendrius channel, um, but this particular documentary, hang on, let me just close my Skype and go full screen here. This is the documentary where the guy he is a contractor and he goes all over Egypt and he says, look, man, this is concrete. I'm telling you right now, this is concrete. And right now at the very opening of this video, he's at the beach. And I think he's a couple of miles away from the Great Pyramid Complex. And he says at very, very low tide, you can see the leftover concrete. Um, see if I can find it here. Okay, so he's at the beach. It's low tide. Um, obviously, some leftover, you know, rock here. But then he shows right there. Uh, that's that looks, con that's concrete. That looks like an old statue that's fallen over and it's covered with lichen and stuff now. Well, it actually looks like to me that the inner core of the stone that Brian Forrester was looking at that had the black granite exterior. Yeah, right, right. It looks like it something. looks like a rough aggregate inner core. Oh, you're talking about the one on the left. I'm talking about the one in the middle of the screen. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about that one, the, the main one, the big one in the middle. Oh, are you really? I mean, yeah. it, it looks like that same material 
that's on the inside of that stone at the, I begin agree. At the beginning of Brian Forrester's video. Oh, to me, that looks like a statue that's been carved, and now it's it's been because it's been in the water for such a long time. It's covered with lichen or lichen yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Oh. Lichen. Lichen. I got. I can't see it. It's not. It's a little on the screen. It's a little box on the screen. Oh, um, there it is. I, un I unclicked. Hang on a second. Yeah, I should be still sharing full screen. Okay. Uh, it's doing an echo there. Okay. Oh, look at that. Now, yeah. ignoring the mollusks and lichens, uh, that's that looks like concrete. And that's yeah. the way concrete behaves when you leave it in the ocean or leave it in the water. That's how it deteriorates. Oh. I mean, that's really what decomposed, de decomposed uh, granite looks like. Here in this video, you see the inset window, and the inside is very rough. As though there, in fact, if you look at the very bottom of this inset window, you see what looks like mortar oozing out the bottom. Yeah, I see something there, yeah. Right above the word yeah. ancient egypt at the, at the you know that white yeah. letter yeah I, I like see a it. little gray layer of you know looks like looks yeah, like I, concrete pouring out really yeah I yep. see it. if i see it i see it so i'm just going to skip through this video a little bit here we go it's getting closer on that you can see it's like literally it looks like gray concrete that's oozing out the bottom of that window there now this is really 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 curious here this is a statue obviously but there's a strange inset in the arm there which makes absolutely no sense let me see wow yeah that is strange like there was something stuck in it yep like somebody uh, like it was soft clay type stuff and they pushed something in now if you also look below where his arms are crossed you see what looks like I don't know an inch or so or maybe two inches I don't know the scale of what I'm looking at it could be huge but you see where it's it's like a this layer is sort of coming off almost right it's like a rough edge along there uh-huh like it's in two pieces and that's the top half. It's, it's like if you were to plaster your wall and then the plaster comes loose, yeah. how you still have a smooth, flat drywall behind, but you have this layer of plaster that's left behind. This shows you that some of the plaster has come off. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that the reason you're talking about this is you have a theory. No, I'm just going with the same theory that's presented in this particular documentary, which is the concrete theory. The ah. idea that they were pulverizing this stone of various kinds between the, all the different kinds of stone that they were working with, uh -huh, particularly uh -huh. granite, uh -huh, uh -huh. limestone, some of the other stones that they were working with. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Then they were turning it into a concrete kind of a mixture, and they were smearing it over a rough form, uh -huh. and then and then modeling and shaping while it was soft yeah and, pr and printing as well sure yeah stamping also yeah. yeah um one of the things that i did was uh a research on something um uh, called the book of enoch i'm not sure if you're familiar with that or not have you ever heard of that oh yes i have heard of it okay oh yeah <laughs> i know you have baby um <laughs> The Book of Enoch is a, what they call Hebrew pseudepigraphia, and what that means is it's a Hebrew uh, religious text that's not considered um, uh, uh, authorized reading material, so it's not included in the Torah or the Tanakh or the Bible as a result. Any of the ancient Hebrew writings, like the Old Testament, uh, don't contain the Book of Enoch. It's interesting. I don't know exactly why. There are two, actually two different books of Enoch. One of them is written later um, uh, 
it's about a guy who has a trip through the uh, the, the zodiacal constellations totally different than uh, the original and i'm not sure if it was just a really good disinformation piece or what it was uh but the the original is a real eye opener in the in the in the text it says that he's taken up into into space by an angel and he describes where he's at and it sounds just like a supermassive black hole it sounds like a, what they call, it's in, an, in its active phase. Supermassive black holes are at the center of every galaxy. Yeah. In, in fact, the galaxies themselves are created by the supermassive black holes at their centers. And then the, the astronomers are figuring this out, that, that every, every single, and, and you can tell by the spin uh, that what's happened is it's, 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 sucked in all this material and then spit it out in these long uh, streams. If you've ever seen a picture of a quasar. Uh -huh. um, I know what you're that, talking about. Yeah. Those are called uh, the, the descending and ascending columns of uh, radioactive jets. They're radioactive jets of material. Our radiation material. What? I, I forgot that word. I know the rest of it anyway. Uh, so he's describing it. It sounds like that they're right along the edge of the supermassive black hole. And he's looking at, and is talking about how stars are being sucked into this thing. And he calls it the prison house of the angels. Now, the thing is that in, in those ancient Hebrew texts, angels and stars are sim they're, they're the same thing. An angel is a star, star is an angel. In other words, if it right. says a, a star fall from heaven, later it's an angel that's talking. So right. is it a star or is it an angel? Which is it? Well, in this example, he's talking about these, and, and the description, he was upset. He was trying to figure out what it all meant. And the angel who's with him, which doesn't make any sense if it's a star, what's it doing with it? The angel tells him, uh, why are you upset? He's like, I'm trying to figure out what this is. I'm looking at. I mean, a very distressing thing for him to say. And he said, uh, uh, this, is a, they, they, this is a prison house for the stars who did not rise like they should. Like they were disobeying God's laws. Now, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is a scientist trying to explain to this guy from ancient you know, well, Mesopotamia, uh, why uh, the, the, what the physics are of a supermassive black hole and why there's a star being torn apart by the supermassive black hole. I mean, this is a text from thousands of years ago. I'm like totally floored while I'm reading this thing. And I'm thinking, this is, how come nobody ever talks about this? This is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's because it's a religious text that people are scared of it, but I mean, it's science right there. That's science. The yeah. guy is witnessing it thousands of years ago. He's seeing it firsthand. The, um, it, it wasn't our galaxy either because it was in, in act, was in the active stage. And if our galaxy was in the active stage, we'd all be dead. Um, I absolutely want to come back to that. We still have an hour and a half to go. We have plenty of time. And I definitely want to get into... Um, pick your brain a little bit on what you know about uh, the Book of Enoch. Um, while I've got this on the screen here, I want to show you that this particular statue, the one on the right, the female, yeah. look, at her, look at her nose. What nose? Exactly. It's hollow. That statue is hollow. Wow, yeah. That was not carved from a single block of stone. Exactly. By the way, um, it, it, just in case anybody watching can't see if it's not large enough on your screen, this is Chris Everard, and uh, the uh, documentary is Evidence of Concrete and Cement in Ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. So um, this documentary is pretty mind-blowing. He shows multiple, multiple examples, and somewhere in here I'm going to find where you brought up um, in the king's chamber that there are the polygonal stones behind a piece of that red granite wall that was chipped off. 
So I'm just going to jump forward a couple of times here and see if I can find my way around and make a few good points. That looks like, oh no, that's not it. This is actually, this is the same two statues just from a different angle. Okay, yeah. But in a second, it'll scroll up and it'll show very clearly that her nose is missing. It's a separate piece and it's absolutely hollow inside. Yep, crazy. Look at that. So how much easier would it be to carve these statues if you were working with a clay-like material, something soft? Substantially easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it makes sense, too. It's a more logical approach. Now, this particular column here not only shows the scaling that occurs when you have a plaster that separates from the substrate, but if you look down below, if you see on the uh, on the words Egypt in white lettering on the bottom of the screen, yeah, look at that section of column right there. See the yeah. scalloping yeah. In, in the highlighted area. Yep. Again, the that looks to me as a contractor, it looks like a tool was used to smear and press layer upon layer of some clay-like material to build that rough column into place and then later on yeah. they came back with a, a another type of concrete whether it be red granite and I don't know which one this is made out of could be limestone um, but down on the bottom it looks like if you had a, a big chunk of clay and you were using your finger to gouge you know and shape like if you look right below where it says Egypt on the screen there that's they're almost the same size and shape each one of those little scallop marks uh -huh. Yep. And this is an example of a guy building an automobile working with clay. This is and then here we have these kind of statues. And again, how much easier would it be to make something like this if you were working with a soft clay like material that would harden into a concrete? Yeah. There was a guy on AboveTopSecret.com, other than Scott Crichton, uh, years ago, who had a, a, an entire, I don't know, it was a huge um, theory that he had developed that the Great Pyramid was actually cement, or, you know, made of limestone cement. Well, it very well could be. Yeah, you still got the problem of hauling those bags of cement up the side of the mount, up the side of the pyramid, though. Well, yeah, no one's saying that it wasn't work and there's not good craftsmanship, but it appears that many, not all, but many or most of the statues and even obelisks were not carved from single blocks of stone. Right. Yes, I agree. They were. They, they surely give the impression now, that they were more likely uh, plastered over and worked as a soft. Here we go. Yes, Amy, correct. Um, this is the part I was looking for because I was going to say, the guy making this video, he says, look, I suspected this, but nobody in Egypt in their right mind would let me break open, you know, take a sledgehammer and, and look inside any of these statues or carvings. Right, nobody in their right mind would would allow such a thing. Uh -huh. But here we have ISIS, right? The world famous ISIS. Uh, that, that is not Egyptian, though. That is uh, Syri yeah, Syrian, actually. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. So they were in Syria, and they were destroying a lot of this artwork. Anything that they couldn't carry off and sell in the black market, you know, they were breaking it and destroying it. And he said that he went there after the fact. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe they're doing that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, if you didn't Pretty know. Sad, huh? Yeah. huh? Yeah. Oh, if you didn't... man. Oh, did, uh, what was that, Nineveh that they were destroying there or what? Oh, jeez. Oh. But the, the guy says he went there after these guys, after, you know, ISIS did their thing and came and left. And he was able to see 
inside of these statues and sculptures. And here we have this particular image here looks very much like aggregate concrete where yeah. piece, pieces of aggregate had fallen out. So I guess there is a silver lining to ISIS destroying that stuff because now we get to look inside of it directly. They were at one point uh, threatening to blow up the Great Pyramid, and I was like, "Why? You know, why destroy things? It's like they're it's part of that whole theory I have that, that it's a reboot. They're working on a reboot, and to do that, they have to destroy the prior civilization and all of its uh, history." That's why they're doing this shit. Excuse my language again. Well, I have, um, you know, we have our own theories around here. We are a conspiracy-minded group, and it's pretty well known that ISIS was uh, created by the Western governments, and uh, they're working, yep. they're armed and trained and funded and literally created for our purposes, our government's purposes, and one of those purposes is to literally destroy our history so that we don't know who we are and where we come from. Sad. Well, I think they've already accomplished a lot of that <laughs> well, to begin with. Yes, but it, it, it's, an, <laughs> it's an ongoing thing, though. I mean, they don't... Yeah, yeah. You know, anything that's left, they're going to continue to destroy until there's literally nothing left. Ah, that's so, so shame. Sad. It is on all that archaeology. Oh my gosh, it's like painful to look at. Um, I, can I grab a coffee? Can we take like a, a minute break or something? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead and grab some coffee. Um, I'll be right back. And I'm going to go ahead and chat with Amy and scroll through this video until I find that good spot that I was looking for. It's truly incredible that they think that anyone thinks that this sort of thing is an acceptable behavior. You know, it's, it's sad. But then that may be how they managed to get rid of so much evidence of all of the uh, uh, civilizations that went prior to this one. And I am back. Hacked, hacked okay. it to pieces or something. One of the things that was discovered through the process of, of destroying these statues was that some of them had steel reinforcing rods. No, in they had rebar in them. <laughs> oh my they gosh. Sure did. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And now, now that suggests to one of two things: either the statues that were destroyed were fakes, or that when they were originally built, however many thousands of years ago, that they were built with steel reinforcements interesting and con and concrete <laughs> and some forms of concrete yeah made of the various aggregate materials that were used uh -huh. very very interesting now if you look at that particular head that's being busted off the wall there you can see that the inner material is different than the outer material and it appears to have a large hollow cavity inside of it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And look at there. That is a steel I-beam sticking out oh of the gosh. wall. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. How about that? Pretty amazing. I mean, that's a head scratcher right there. Yeah, that is. That's a very much a head scratcher. So, the chances are that uh, the if they they did have tech, if they did have high technology or higher technology than we thought they did. Uh, but it appears to be earthly technology, like cement and bars of steel and rebar and and I beams. I beams, yes. <laughs> I mean, look at that. I mean, yep. this is not Photoshop, folks. Uh, how about that? Uh -huh. Here's another uh, another bar sticking out of the wall there. Oh my goodness. This is depressing. Uh -huh. 
Now, I don't have a, a mouse pointer to use. I wish I could back it up because a moment ago, when the head came off, here, here's the guy working the clay for the cars again. A moment ago, when the, when the guy busted the head off that statue, you could actually see, a, if you pause it just right, you can see a tiny steel rod sticking right up out of the center of her neck. Uh, da, 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 da. Back to this one again. Okay, now this is cuneiform where they were using styluses to press into clay as an example. Um, now what I think we're looking at right here is... Um, molds that were used to pour metal for reinforcements like or or to use perhaps even as chisels so they had molten metal and they'd pour them into these stone insets and then it you know would cool and harden and they could shape it and sharpen it um, the one on top almost looks like a spearhead and um forget what the guy actually says in the video about this that's some really interesting terracing right there. That's a lot of work, boy. Hmm. Yes, it is. <coughs> Let's see here. I want to get to something interesting, and then we're going to go back, and I want to talk about, you know, here we are. I think these guys in this documentary, they're actually grinding up and sifting um, marble. Whoa. So that, uh, for the purpose of reconstituting it into a granite-like material. Right. And there it is in clumps and with the right binding agent. And, and the guy was saying that experts who examined after the stuff hardened said that you can't distinguish it from the real thing. Right, right. And there's one of them stupid pounding stones, which is oddly round. It's almost perfectly round. looks like a cannonball. looks like a, a projectile. Yep. Now, those aren't so round. But there it is. Still could be, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Could be, you know, trebuchet projectiles. They didn't. They didn't make those uh, carvings with punning stones. I'm sorry. No. Here we go. There it is. Okay. This is inside the king's chamber, and what we're looking at is a red granite wall with, you know, the relief carvings, right? What? But if you, but if if you look at, I don't think we're in the king's chamber. No, the king the king's chamber has um, no hieroglyphs or carvings. We're in we're in, a, um, we're in okay. a temple. All right, sorry. You know what? Um, I'm actually going to unmute this for a minute, and there might be a little feedback. I want to hear what this guy says because he tells you exactly where it is. Exactly the same components as natural limestone and granite. Right, now we come to absolute incontrovertible truth about the amazing Can you hear? Range yeah. Yes. Ancient Egypt. What you can see here in this wall is that a section was removed. This is at the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies. Luxor. And something was removed. It could have been just the thin panel being chipped away. Somebody wanted to take, uh, say, for example, one of these figures, which you see here. Maybe there was a, a similar figure there. The wall that has been exposed behind is using this amazing polygonal technique. Uh, how about that? And why is it done? It's done because the ancient Egyptians knew that from time to time there are tremors and earthquakes. In actual fact, earthquake proof. Once or um, at the back of one of the um, sacred lakes, there's a kind of sculpture graveyard full of amazing sculptures smashed to pieces um, that were damaged during an earthquake. It was only around 40 years ago. 
Um, and this reminds me of Inca stonework, where you can see that each block has got a very, very bizarre shape. There's lots of guides. There's official guides and there's other. Okay, so there you go. There's a polygonal stone structure behind that wall. That's amazing, yeah. Well, it makes sense. They want to make sure their buildings don't fall down. Can so I? Obvious, go ahead. I just want to mention something. We've got a jerk in the uh, live oh. chat called Full Investigation. Hello. You might want to get rid of this ding dong. Hello, Full Investigation. It's, it's, it's Michael Resnicki. Yeah. No. Doesn't matter. He's the one. That, he's the one with fifty gazillion. Yeah, it doesn't matter who he is. <clears throat> yep. Thank you. <laughs> we'll get a we'll get a few more thumbs down for that. <laughs> yeah. He'll, he'll be he'll be trumping in with one or his accounts or another. Yepers. Uh okay, well, uh anyway. Uh there was a video, I don't know if you've seen it or not, called Revelation of the Pyramids that goes through um, all of the ancient cultures that all had a similar building technique, the polygon, polygonal structures, all over the world. Yeah. And uh, it, the temple, the Osirion temple at Abydos, Abydos uh, that is also polygonal, but they were d the exact same on both sides. It was weird. They had the uh, oddly puzzle P-shaped blocks with duplicate oddly puzzle shaped blocks on the other side. It was like, oh, well, that's interesting. Hmm. They could, you know, because the the, the 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 point the guy was making in the video was uh, they could say, well, that they did that. Uh, Egyptologists would say, well, they just did that with the broken leftover pieces from the quarry, and that's why they're oddly shaped. No. <laughs> well, otherwise, how they get? They managed to get the exact same kind of piece for both sides and over the door lintel, and sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and yeah, right. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to go ahead and move a little bit fast. I want to skip through the rest of this, and then we'll get back to. Uh, okay. Uh, there was one other thing I think I wanted to show on this particular documentary here. <laughs> Here we go. This is the cores, one of the cores. Yeah. You see how the taper on that core, it's smaller on the bottom and thicker on the top? Yeah. You can't get that with a copper tube. It doesn't work. Uh -huh. it's gonna, it'll bind up inside the tube. If you, had a, if you were using a tube to core, then the core is exactly the same size and shape as the tube. Uh-huh. Yep. And that only works one way, and you do not get the taper as seen here in that's, that core. That's actually pretty. Yeah, it is. It's really lovely. Now, they were using tubular cores, and you can see here where a section of the inner core had broken off, and you can see around the bottom inner part where the tube had continued to cut. So that's no question. They were using tubular cores. But as he points out here, this is somebody's, um, I, I guess, called like cultured marble. It's a, it's a countertop. Uh-huh. You know, we can mix all kind of various things. And make it look like marble. In this case, there's, you know, blue glass and looks like black pieces of glass and, you know. Right. Could be could be concrete, could be uh, marble, and then it mixed with a binding agent and poured into a mold. Yep. Yep. And by the way, if you pour just just any old concrete from Home Depot, if you had a mold, and the mold had a very very smooth surface on the inside, like literally a polished surface, and you just simply mixed concrete, poured it into this mold, when it hardened and came out, you're going to get what looks like polished concrete. It'll be that smooth. Yep. Just like this. So the inside of that wooden box, if it was a smooth, sanded, perhaps shellac 
surface, very smooth surface, then you'll get a polished surface when it comes out. And these tool marks that we see might not necessarily be the tool marks of a power tool. They could very simply be the tool marks of a stick or somebody's finger in soft material. Yep. Well, I don't know if that one is. I don't know. I don't think that's somebody's hand. <laughs> no, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just suggesting. I mean, look, I've worked with clay before. Yeah, me too. That yep, me that, too. That's hard for me to get back exactly where I was. Let's see if I can find that picture again. Um, so, I mean, if you work with actual, like, modeling clay, like this guy who's doing the car here. Yeah. Um, and you're using your bare hands you may have noticed that your fingerprint will actually leave little grooves as right. you smear along. Yeah. Kind of yep. like, like we saw in that in that picture just a second ago. That old guy would have to have pretty big uh, uh, skin, uh, we call it the little swirlies on your fingers. Fingerprints. Fingerprints. <laughs> yeah. To make those wide of spaces, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, it, right if, it's, if it's soft, obviously, yeah, that looks too regular for a person's <laughs> finger. It looks more like a a bar or something that's got an extra ridge on it. If you're looking, if you look at it, it's got a lip. Yep, but it doesn't necessarily just because it's a tool mark doesn't mean it was a tool that was used against hard material. Could have been a tool right. used against some something. I think, you, we've already established that. <laughs> okay. Yep. 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 Well enough. Okay. That's you're right. It. Let's yeah, get no, off that subject. No. 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 I'm just saying that I think it's established well enough established now that they were using uh, some kind of. Yeah. Soft yeah. Stuff. You're right. You're absolutely right. No. You. You're totally right. Oh no! I feel bad. No. 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 I no. I don't feel bad. I mean. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time, you know, on my presentation that this isn't about me. This is really about you. So let's, um, let's listen. Let me ask you this question before I forget, because I was curious about it. And somebody in the comment thread on my promo video asked me to ask you, and I have, was already curious about it myself, um, ooh parts. Uh-huh. I've never heard it. Don't know what it is. So it's why don't of, you just tell me? It's out of place artifacts. Oh. They're out of place in the timeline. They're like oh. like for example that gadget that they found in the in the bay or something, that Greek uh, the Antikythera device. That's it, right there. Uh that is an out of place artifact because it looks pretty dance. There are a lot of gears and and it could keep track of you know the movements of the planets and the, the eclipses and stuff and it was just a really complicated device for the for the time frame but i've seen a uh a documentary on what the ancient greeks could do and they were pretty ingenious i mean they were they were actually using this as a form of uh, making people believe that the gods were present in the temple with this technology that they had developed with gears and steam and you know they're using science and physics to freak yeah, people they, out. They, they were they were they were doing uh wizard of oz stuff <laughs> yes they were they were doing wizard of oz exactly stuff. definitely and uh you saw that video did you see it no anything? but I, I I have heard I I don't know whether it's that video but I have I have read and seen stuff that would suggest that the Greeks had some uh, sleight of hand that they created to uh, make people believe that they yeah, were... they, they had enough information or they knew how to open the doors of the temples pneumatically using yep. air pressure from water and steam building up and opening the door they, hmm. big, big doors squeak, you know and then when, at the same time as this was happening, this metal, uh, uh, what, I don't know if it was a, a chariot or what it was, it was some kind of a riding device, would go across the ceiling uh, high up inside the temple all the way to the front to disappear in the back. And that was supposedly evidence that Zeus was present. <laughs> 
something like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, oh, yeah. They, oh, yeah. They had all kinds of interesting, weird stuff that they did. And they yeah. used their understanding of science to do this. And that leads me to the belief that a lot of what we call unscientific miraculous things that you read about are actually not unscientific at all. They're just advanced science and we're not giving them credit for having that knowledge at the time. <laughs> Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable uh, from magic. That's right. That's right. So Beth, uh, the person I refer to is called Miss Conge uh, Misconcealed Reality and she was asking on the subject of ooh parts. She says, um, have you ever come across the Willis vessels? That doesn't sound familiar. W I L L I S vessels. I I haven't heard of it either. No, that doesn't sound I can, familiar. That's I can look it up. Yeah, do it, do it. She said the first she had heard of them was back in the nineties, and they are metal plates and bowls with the illegibility to project hologram images. Never heard of it. So it's W I L L I S Willis vessels. Hmm. Yeah. I've never heard of it either. So that's a really good question. Um, have you ever done any study or research on the Ark of the Covenant? Um, limited, yes, limited. Um, from you know, from what I understand, uh, you know, I've heard all the stories that um, if you got too close to it, that you would. Um, um, you were subject to uh, symptoms of radiation poisoning. Um, I also understand that the word arc is also a reference to an electrical arc and that a lot of people claim that it to be a capacitor of some kind, that it would store electrical energy. Static electric electricity, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of makes sense why they would be carrying it around using wooden poles. And, and, the non -conductive. People, and the people who um, were allowed to be near it had to wear a special kind of material that uh, didn't uh, complete the circuit. Well, this is very strange because I'm, I'm looking up Willis vessels and it's telling me about something to do with the heart. The oh. aorta, circle Willis vessels, and atherosclero atherosclerosis. Hmm. Huh. Huh. So, uh, I, I don't know what to make of that. I don't either. I'll have to check it out. Um, it could be that it could be that whatever this technology is that she's talking about is based on a named after that part of your heart or something because it looks like it or whatever. Could be. Um, anyway, uh, the um, what were we just talking about? Willis vessels, the heart, Ark of the that. Covenant. Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you hear the story uh, that's actually in the Old Testament about what happened when the Philistines took it. Mm -mm. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. I think something went wrong in the translation. Because it claims that when the Philistines took it, it gave them hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> and they returned it like a month later. Not only did they return it, but they returned it with little gold statues that they made of their hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably a mistranslation there somewhere. <laughs> I know, you know, I'm thinking that when I read that, they were like, I've, uh, I've never had a golden hemorrhoid <laughs> that I could make any use out of. So. <laughs> See, that's one of the things I like to do is find the passages that are like, what the scratch head things, like the bottomless pit and the that reference. <laughs> I found another reference that, that, that said that God was going to destroy the Mastabas of the Egyptians. And in the yeah, that's in the original language. It's called Mastaba in the original, uh, but in the English it says the images of the Egyptians. And I was like, well, why would they change that? And a Mastaba and an image are two different things. 
So there must be some reason why they made that change. And I realized that at that point that I was going to actually have to look up the original language for all of the words uh, when I was doing research. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I started that crazy um, uh, trail of research on the bottomless pit. And by the way, in the... Uh, the second verse of the whole Bible, you got Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 2 says, and the earth was void and without form. Okay? The word was there is not the original. The original was become, which in the past tense is became. So the earth became void and without form. So that means that the second verse is telling us that Everything that comes after that point, everything that comes after the earth becoming void and without form is a, a civilization that started after a cataclysm that caused the earth to be void and without form before that. And it's, when it says earth, it's not talking about the planet. It's talking about the habitable land. Uh, they, they didn't think in terms of globe. They thought in terms of where I live, the ground I walk on, uh, where I plant, where I eat. Mm -hmm. So when they say, and the earth became inhabitable, they're uninhabitable and void, they mean that the earth was a disaster in some kind of cataclysm and everything was being rebooted. The plants were being replanted, the trees were being regrown, the dry land, uh, the water was pulling back to reveal dry land that was already there. The, the, then the first group of Adam were created. And some of them were women and some of them were men and they were made in the image of the Elohim, which is a plural word. It means a whole bunch of gods. Yeah. I was thinking, well, maybe it's talking about all these people are the different racial groups. You know, you've got some that are African and some that are uh, European and some that are Asian. And, and so it explains why we have, you know, specific racial groups here. But we could be from all over the place. We could be from all over the universe. Sure, and I think it's really interesting that there's a there's a phrase in the Bible, supposedly said by God um, to Adam and his family, right? Or was said to Cain, or right? He said, "Go forth and replenish the earth." Yeah. Well, there's an argument that now, says that the word "replenish" is not an accurate translation; that it's always okay. meant. Okay, and where do you where are you on that? I, well, because of the, the mistranslation of the word was and the fact that uh, later on, um, one of the guys says, uh, like Moses or somebody, I forget who it was, he says, uh, the earth was not created void. It wasn't created a Tahu or Bahu or whatever those words were. I can't remember the exact words now. Um, they Tohu and Bohu. Uh, which means void without form, you know, and a mess. That's uh, actually uh, something that happened after it was created. So, and who knows how long after it was created. So it sounds like a re-terraforming and a replanting and a refurbishing of the planet. And then people, it, the interesting part to me was if you compile that story in that form, and you compare it to the story, the Sumerian story, uh, I think it's the story of Atrahasis, who says uh, that the Anuna, who were the, the junior gods, were working hard. They were put to the labor by Enlil, the Sumerian god of the air. Uh, and he was working them like slaves. And uh, they decided to go on the very first strike in written history. Uh, they all went on strike and they surrounded Enlil's temple and he was freaking out. So he contacted Enki, who was away in the Abzu. And so he came back and he said, well, no wonder. You, you work on them all the time. They're, they're tired. You don't give them a vacation or anything. No break. I mean, they're tired of working. And uh, so anyway, the solution to the problem was to create a more pliable worker that's the second guy the second adam that's created the first adam is the junior gods the second one is the is us yeah so you're talking about the agg miners yeah the, the 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 first one is the anuna 
in the story of Atrahasis, the junior gods who are made in the images of the, the senior gods, who the are an Anunnaki, the Anuna are being worked like slaves, basically, and they're getting tired of it. I thought the I thought that was the Ajiji. They were the first uh, set of slaves that, well, that were unhappy and. If you follow the the way the word the words are used throughout history, you find out that there's a, a rep, rep, repetition. It, a different word means same thing. Like. Uh, uh, have you ever uh, followed, read the, the honorary titles of a king or a queen or a prominent figure? Though, so like a musician, an artist, a master's degree, uh, you know, the king of the land. Uh, the, the, Jesus has a bunch of titles. He's the master physician, the Lord, the king, the uh, prince of peace, the, yeah, all on and on and on. So, the band ancient times sometimes they would pull pull out a title and use that to describe the person when that might not have actually been you and they use it as their person's name like nimrod the word nimrod actually means rebel in hebrew that's probably not his real name that's probably just one of his titles the rebel and so they just called him the rebel in their you know because that's how they knew him but that wasn't his actual birth name this is an example so one guy who was doing research on ancient the, the connection between ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia noticed in one of the texts, it's an Akkadian text, and Akkad is the civilization that follows directly after Sumer, the same area, and Iran, Iraq area. Uh, he, um, this one guy, his name was Enmakar, which is a royal title. Um, there's a text called Emekar and the Lord of Arata. And when you read it, you realize that this is actually the Tower of Babel story with more detail, a lot more detail. And he's off offered to rebuild the temple of Ianana or Inanna. Sorry, I didn't say that right. Inanna. I's are pronounced like E's. E's are pronounced like A's. It's crazy language. Anyway, did I lose you? No. Okay. Anyway, if you follow that, that name actually translates to uh, the name of the first pharaoh of Egypt, uh, the, as far as dynastic pharaohs go, uh, Narmer, N-A-R-M-E-R. -E of course, there's a, a little debate there over whether it was Narmer or Menes who was the first, or whether they were even the same person, maybe. Uh, but this is a, the problem, and you see the same problem with the word you mentioned, is that, you know, it... It could be just one of many, any, many titles. The IGG is another name for the Anuna. Hmm. That's an example. And so one of the things I did was I looked at the text and I said, okay, if Moses actually wrote the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the, of the Bible or the Torah, uh, if he wrote that, or the original, because there are some evidence that there may have been three different writers, uh, Moses being the first, and then the other two filling in the uh, additional details. Um, when uh, he looked at this, you figure he's being raised by Pharaoh's scholars. He's being taught the Egyptian history of the world. Because, you know, he's going to write this stuff down. And now to think about this, according to the, the flood account, there's this huge disaster the whole planet is basically screwed up, and when they come back, they re-inhabit the Earth. Sort of like the beginning of the Genesis story. They re- they retake over, and I'm thinking, well, maybe when Ham, who was one of Noah's sons, went to Egypt, he was just going back there. Not for the first time, but he was returning to where he originally was from, and he's re-establishing the Egyptian civilization because that is what Egypt needs. Egypt comes from the word Kem, K-H-E-M, yep. which is from the word Ham. The Ham and the Kem are the same thing. Oh, huh. interesting. And yes. So now I'm thinking about it. He's, so that means that if, if Noah's descendants, Ham being one of them, Reestablished civilization in Egypt, 
that means the history of what happened before then is being written by his scholars into Egyptian texts that would be passed down to uh, the more to Moses's time, which would be you know a couple three thousand years later, well, a couple thousand, no, one thousand about fifteen hundred years later, something like that, and uh, he would have taken that story and. Now, at the same time, according to Bible, his mother was there as his wet nurse. And his mother was from Mesopotamia. She would have given him the Mesopotamian version of the story, which was slightly different from the Egyptian one, because the Egyptian one had taken on nuances uh, that were unique to Egypt and unique to Ham, because, of course, Ham would have had his own... Um, his own um, personality, his own way of telling the story, his own embellishments perhaps, who knows. But by the time the story gets to Moses, from his mom and from Pharaoh's scholars, he would have realized, if he looked at them close enough, that these were the same story. And that they just have cultural twists, and these names are the same names. For example, who was the God that created Life on the planet, according to the Egyptians, it was Atum, A-T-U-M. I'm thinking, Atum, that sounds like Adam. I wonder if it's the same word. Um, it, it's not only the same word, but it's also the same word. There's three, the, the, the Egyptian A-T-U-M, and then there's the biblical A-D-A-M, and then we have the scientific A-T-O-M. Yeah. Okay, now look, just hang on. All, and the Egyptians said, all is Atum. Yeah, yeah, before we get that far, before we get that far. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, you got you got Adam and Atum. These are but in according to the text, Atum is a god and Adam is a guy that's made in the image of a god. So maybe the the Bible is trying to say that Atum really wasn't a god. He was just some guy made in the image of God. Uh but but I went a little further, and then went all the way back to the very first name on the Sumerian kings list, which was Alulim, A-L-U-L-I-M, Alulim, that's hard to say. Anyway, it turns out that Alulim is an ancient Sumerian word that's the same thing as Adam. Oh. I was like, okay, wait, if that's Adam, and it, I realized by the time it was over with that the, the original the original gods were the Atum. There was more than one. They were called the Atum. The, the Egyptians called them. Okay? Okay? Okay, now, we got the Atum, and we've got these, these, uh, I didn't know what your brain's doing right now. We've got the Atum, and Moses is trying to write this down in a way that people won't get confused. So, he decides to use the Mesopotamian word, which by the time of Moses would have would have the, the, the spelling would have very went from being A L U L I M to E L O H I M. So it would uh -huh. have been Elohim, which is the word for God in Hebrew and those passages. Interesting. Yeah. And then by the time it gets to that same spot of Moses in the Egyptian timeline, it's A T U M. And so He's like, how do I tell this so it doesn't confuse people? So I used the Mesopotamian word for the creator, Elohim, or creators. Uh, I believe there was one creator, but he copied us in the image of many gods, not just one. And then uh, the uh, Egyptian version he used for the name of the created. So you got the creator name coming from Mesopotamia. The created people coming from Egypt. Now I don't know if he did that because he was prejudiced, or if it would just seem like it was the most logical approach to, because it all means the same thing. And he knew that. I'm thinking he's looking at this and going, "Okay, these people were called the Atum because they were made in the image of the Atum, so they were like Atum Junior or the Anuna or the Igg." Hmm. Well, that's interesting how you tied some of those together. You made some connections I hadn't con considered before. Well, if you follow the story along, in the on the story of Atrahasis, it says that he makes a more pl 
viable worker, right, to replace these guys. I don't know what happened to the originals. So have you read the entire Atrahasis? Yeah. Okay, I'm as we speak, I'm pulling out an old, old notepad where I was, uh, for over a period of probably two years through various studies here and there, every time I come across an alternate name for a particular person or God, um, I would jot it down and I have these lists of different names that are all basically the same person throughout different cultures. Right, right. And um, I'm looking here because if I'm not mistaken, Noah is also known as Atrahasis and he's also known as Zithrus. It's X I S U T H R U S. Yeah, and the Which is the Asudra, which is another spelling of it. What, another spelling is what? The Asudra. Spell that for me. Uh. <laughs> Just try, sound it out. <laughs> uh, Z I A S U D R A. Maybe? The Asudra. See, I've heard that. Okay. I've yeah. heard that one. Okay. I've got a list here. Let me tell tell me what you think of this one. Cuz we were talking about Enoch earlier. And this is a significant list. Enoch was also Marduk, who was also Zeus, Jupiter, Abraxas, Baal, Osiris, who also happened to be Jesus and Mithra. Um the the Jesus Jesus and Baal, not true, but Jesus and some of the others, maybe. And Now, the reason why I say uh, Baal is not him, because I, I identify Baal as being Enlil. You, you identify Baal as Enlil? Okay. Yeah, and I will explain why in a, in a minute, so once you're done with your point. Oh, no. I, well, the only, real, the only real point I wanted was just to verify, because I was trying to remember, because I, I thought I had remembered that Noah was also known as Atrahasis. And so I just wanted to pull this pile of, uh, you know, uh, list out that I had acquired. And um, I just, you know, just wanted to throw a list at you that uh, just to see what you thought about it. Let's see. I've also got here, uh, just for the fun of it, Helios is also Saturn, Kronos, Enki, El, Ra, Ea, Shamash, Alep Shamash, Amun, Kenshu, and also Cain of the Bible, and you ready for this one, Amy? Amaterasu Solar. <laughs> oh, is she there? <laughs> Did you catch that? He's saying you're Anki, dear. <laughs> I think she went to have a cigarette. She disappeared on us. Uh oh. Okay, well. That I find very interesting. Um, I will explain uh, my position on Enki in a second here once you're done. No, I I'm mean, done. I just wanted to oh. throw that out to see what you thought of it. I really wasn't trying to make any major point there. Okay. And, and I do believe that that last particular list that I read to you, I know that I've got a strong feeling that a couple of those belong in different lists because Amaterasu Solar, I know from speaking with Amy, that that is the Japanese solar deity and it is a female. It is a, it, right, it, right. Well, that doesn't mean much. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got you know, it's a goddess. I've got other. I've got you know, right. god lists and goddess lists. Is, you know, I've got yeah. you know, uh, Adrian, Ceres, Demeter, uh, Dawn, Durga, Hecate, Hera, Juno, Kali, Rhea, Hecate. and, and Damkina. Hecate. Oh. Hey, the pagan has Hecate. entered the room. Hecate. So sorry. <laughs> oh, so sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. the cutting. <laughs> okay, hang in the yani. Are you done? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Go, go, please. Okay. Now, according to the story of the creation of the Adam, remember we've got the original who are duplicates, clones, basically, of the Anunnaki. Okay, now along comes the new guy uh, who can, uh, according to the story, uh, uh he gets knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But if you read just a few verses later, it says, and Adam knew his wife. And was like, 
knew his wife. What, 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 what? Knowledge meant to have sex. It, the tree of knowledge is the tree of sex. It's basically saying that the thing they got was the ability to procreate. And that was a bad thing, apparently, because the clones who couldn't procreate uh, didn't seem to have the same problems, I guess, to the people who could procreate, people who could procreate. Now, why would they do that? Well, because they could clone themselves then. There would have been an endless stream of, of workers for Enlil. So this the serpent story that Aki is the serpent is partially true. He's also the creator. So I'm reading the verses and I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, you got all these people over here who think that they're worshiping the serpent. Now, I'm not talking about people in the Bible. I'm talking about people today. They think they're worshiping Satan or, or the serpent or the devil or this Egyptian serpent god or something like that. They think they're worshiping the set dude or whatever, a snake god they want to conjure up, they think they're worse than that guy because he's cool, and he's evil, and he likes to have sex and freedom. They don't, they don't realize that he is the same guy who created us and shut down the Tower of Babel. This is the same guy. Enki, if you go into the NCAR in the Lord of Arata text, Enki, in the Namsha of Enki part, he talks about shutting it down. And why was he shutting it down? Because it was a world order forming, a world dictatorship. And he shut the thing down. They, the council agreed, we got to shut this down. Or they're going to go back to the same problems they were having before the flood. Hmm. So before this cataclysm that the planet had to be rebooted from, because I believe that the flood account should actually be in the second verse of the Bible, not five chapters later. I mean, they're layered on top of each other. They're not concurrent in timeline. In other words, the flood event and the Noah story are actually the same thing. Uh, the flood event, the Noah story, and the creation, uh, not the creation, but the recreation of the earth. These are... Like, um, for example, um, if you're reading the flood account, you'll notice that it, it sounds like it's talking about the whole world. And then another time when you look at it, you go, well, then how come there are only, according to this, uh, 32 animals on the ark? Hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Well, because there were two different floods. One of them was a global catastrophe, like would be created if like a mile wide or two mile wide asteroid or something hit the earth and it all created a global catastrophe including an ice age now that is global uh whereas the second one maybe that's the black sea flood which just floods all of the land uh, habitable land around coastal regions and rivers and stuff that are attached to major bodies of water like oceans and seas for example, um, these two geologists from Oxford University, uh, one of them in particular had discovered the drill cores of the coral reef off the coast of Africa were showing evidence of some kind of flood event. And so he decided to keep researching and he realized that this actually looked like it might be uh, the, the flood. There were several floods in the, in the year's history, but this one in particular seemed like it might be related to the, uh, the flood of... Uh, Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is basically the same flood as the the story of Noah and the story of Atrahasis. These are the same, uh, and Ziasudra, I think. Yep, same same event. And the other guy you said his name is, starts with an X. Uh, Ziasuthru. Yeah, that guy. Uh, anyway, Ziasuthrus. Same, same story over and over and over again. And isn't there also another, another, actually multiple ancient uh, creation stories that involved um, humans that were androgynous at one point? No, that because I mean you were describing earlier, you know. Uh, 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 that's a mistaking. That's a, as far as I'm concerned. That is actually a mistake in translation. When you look at the original Adam that were created, it's if you if, just do me a favor. When you get the chance and you're thinking about it, go to the the verses 
the talk about the creation of the first Adam being created male and female. I mean, Eve is not even created yet. Eve's later. Okay. So here we got this Adam being created man. They're all called Adam. Why are they all called Adam? Well, it's not because they're all men. They're all being created in the image of the Atom. Are all the Atom men? Are all the Atom uh, hermaphrodites? I don't think there's evidence of that. I think that some of them were men and some of them were women. And we were being, some were male and some were female. Uh, I don't know if they were human. Um, you know, homo sapiens, but we were created in the image of them initially. But when we were given procreation, that changed everything. There is a, a website on the internet called Flying Dragons and Flying Dragons and Gods or something like that, in which the guy says that the original gods were reptilians and that we were originally a bunch of reptiles ourselves and then we all uh, were changed genetically by one of them tinkered with us and made us into mammals. And by, you know, I, I took that in, I took that idea, the research that guy had, and went back into the Bible and started looking at the story of the serpent because I wanted to know uh, who the bad guy was and who the, you know, who the creator was. And I'm not saying that the, the creator is necessarily a good guy, but, I mean, if he created us, it's actually defending us from something bad, well, that's good. And uh, this is the example I was looking for. So I realized that what's happening in Genesis is that they're all following, like Sitchin said, they're all following Enlil. Uh, they originally didn't. They were following Enki. They all started following Enlil because he was the guy in charge of the planet. He was the owner of the, he had like the title of the planet Earth. One of uh, Jesus' titles, which you just reminded me of, uh, is the bright morning star, which was a title that was also given to Lucifer. Right. And I believe that that just meant that they were, this person is the owner of the planet Venus. Not anything else, not anything more. It's just a piece of extraterrestrial real estate belongs to this individual. Uh, that's, and it's sort of like, have you ever uh, watched, uh, have you ever watched the Stargate show? No, well, maybe I've caught a few episodes, you know, a while back. The you mean the TV series? Yeah. I, a, yeah, I never really got into the series. I might have caught a, caught a few of them a long time ago. Well, okay, I'm gonna skip that for right now. I'm gonna go back to Adam and the serpent thing. So the serpent that's giving them knowledge is actually DNA, and it's the DNA of procreation. They're, they're becoming procreative species. Humans were be going from being clones to being procreative. And we have the ability to make clones of ourselves. That's why it says you'll know the, you know, you'll know sex and you'll know good and evil and you'll know, uh, and I think the good was the, the way of looking at the men and the evil was the way of looking at the women. And that's, what's that? I'm sorry. What did What's, you say? I didn't say anything. I, did you hear yeah, something? I don't think anyone. Yeah, there was a thump, 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 thump. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Not like that? So, not like yeah. That. No, that's me bumping my microphone. Sorry. Uh, okay. So um, I, I I believe that, that uh, it's talking about sex. And so the serpent is actually not a person. So you can't say that Enki is... A snake person. Uh, I would be. It's. I'm sort of like Sitchin when on that topic. He believed that the serpent was a, a symbol for DNA, and I agree with him 100% on that. He believes that it, Enki had that symbol on his uniform, and that's why they called him the serpent. In other words, he had a DNA crest to show he was a geneticist on his uh, <coughs> his uniform. So the whole story of Enki and Enlil from the Sumerian texts, um, there's been a lot of back and forth as to how old of a text it is and how long ago that was. Can Do you have an idea in maybe a re some sort of potentially realistic term? What, what, what timeline, what kind of dates are we talking about here? Uh, well... According to Sitchin, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years, and I don't agree with everything Sitchin says. Um, but 
I don't personally know how far back in time their story goes. I only know when it was they started writing it down. So, uh, and see. that's after or that's after a reboot of the planet. You know, the planet's been devastated by a cataclysm, and they're restarting everything. It's weird as you're reading along and like. I don't know, the second chapter, the whole Bible, God's talking about how there's really good gold in this place over by these rivers and stuff. And I'm like, why is that there? It's so out of place. It's just like in the middle of all of this. And so he created this and he created that and he created this and he created that. And, oh, yeah, and God says that there's some great gold over there. Really good gold, high-quality stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. So, how are where are you uh, opinion wise on the ideas in the Sumerian texts where they talked about some of the kings and rulers that uh, would have like a a thirty six on average it was a thirty six thousand year kingship. Are you talking about Sumerian king list? Yes, I mean some of the you know when yeah, the rulers like, would change hands, it was twenty six thousand years up to thirty six thousand years. I think there was but, one that was two hundred fifty thousand SARS or something like that. That was a long time. Well, you know those are still some pretty damn big numbers, no matter how you look at it. And even yep. even if we're talking about you know as the academics would have us believe, a bunch of ancient guys who with no education. Um, <laughs> I defy you to go to the African jungle and, and see if any of those guys can define or, or give you a reference to a number that big, 250,000. Yeah, I need 250,000 pebbles. I need 250,000 shells. I need remember, now remember, you know, anything like that. Remember me earlier telling you that one of the things they were trying to do was establish a new chronology for ancient Egypt because um, what had happened is it had been discovered that Verosis of Mesopotamia – and Manetho of Greece were arguing, or of Egypt, were arguing over who had the most antiquity, the Egyptians or the Mesopotamians. And so the the Egyptians put their pharaohs one right after the other, and the uh, Berossus took the Sumerian king's list as his evidence. So was it actually that way beforehand, or was it, uh, or did he actually concoct that? We don't know. I know that if you go through the the story of the uh, generations, um, I think each one of them lived a little bit shorter timeline in the uh, stories in the Bible. I think of Noah's descendants, like not descendants, his descendants, people before him, his forerunners, his predecessors, whatever you call them, um, his ancestors. There we go. Um, they, uh, every one of them lived a little shorter time. All the way, once you get down to Noah, he's lived the shortest out of all of them. So, what is the oldest civilization you're aware of? Go Blanky. Go Blanky Tepe is. Go Beck Lee Tepe. I can't, a hard one to say. That's the oldest I know of right now. Okay, well, that's a ruined site, and so, I mean, what's... Do, well, I thought you meant do, with evidence. Do they know what civilization? Do they have a name for the civilization that built it? Do they, I mean... No, nobody knows what that is. Have you ever heard of the Pelasgians? Uh-uh. Are you familiar with the researcher David Flynn? Oh, I love David Flynn. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, he is... Uh, Passed away. Yes, he's uh, you know, at a very young age. I think he was in his mid forties. Oh my goodness, it was awful. So, um, look, if you like to read, I'll just recommend a a really, really, really good book. Um, and it, it might come in a two part or two book series. That's how I got. Uh, there were two books that came with it. Um, uh, the book that I'm in the process of reading right now, I haven't been back reading on it in a little while, but anyway, it's called uh, Cydonia, the Secret Chronicles of Mars. Yeah, yeah. I did some research on that, of his material, listened to his videos on it. Um, he refers to the Pelasgians in that book 
uh, being described by the Greeks, and by the way, the, the, the word Pelasgian in Greek, ancient Greek, means the people who lived before the moon. Oh, wow, awesome. I got to read that one. Yeah, so, I mean, if you got a notepad, jot that one down because that's really some interesting stuff to look into. Yeah, not not to mention, that. you. I don't know, you may be familiar also with the uh, Zulu uh, right. tribe of Africa who right. who have a very old uh, oral uh, 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 history where they describe uh, that they themselves were around before the moon because they happened to know that the moon was brought here and put in place. Yeah, is it the Zulu who said that? I know that there's a... The Dogon? Is that what you're thinking? Because I'm, I am I might be confusing the Zulu with the Dogon when it comes yeah. to that myth. Yeah, it could be. Um, the reason uh, I mention that is uh, uh, John Lear was talking one day about... Uh, I wouldn't... I'm sorry, go ahead. He was talking one day about this guy that he knew who wrote to... Uh, Kredo Motwa? No, he wrote... He was a scientist. Hmm. And he had a theory that the earth was, or that the moon was actually towed into place and that it, at one point it had been parked mm -hmm. uh, somewhere else. Richard Hoagland, maybe? Was that the No, it wasn't Hoagland. Was no, it wasn't Hoagland. It was, um, it's a famous author, science fiction writer. I can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, he. Uh, that seemed to impress John Lear. He thought that was pretty cool. The guy said he had evidence of some photographs of uh, what he thought were gigantic ships uh, actually in the rings of Saturn. And what would they be doing there? And he showed us some photographs. I was like, I don't know what those are. Uh, anyway, um... I don't know how far back uh, or if it was even on this planet, because like I told you, um, the when they wrote this stuff down and they said the word Earth, they weren't talking about planet. They were talking about the dirt, the land, the ha habitable land. Um, I'm sorry, you broke up for me a little. Would you just, would you mind repeating all that? Um, you catch all that. You know, I don't know what planet we might be from. If we're from another planet, I mean, we could be. I mean, who knows how long all of this has been going on? Could be billions of years. And um, well, I'm sure you're familiar with Michael Cremo's work and some of the 300 million year old discoveries, along with a 2.5 billion year old discovery. Of human artifacts and, and modern human skeletons. Uh, well, um, one of the things uh, my dog is blinding at me. One of the things that uh, I was thinking was that um, if we were made uh, from pre-existing humans, that we would just be, you know, continuing on the legacy of the planet. But uh, if the scientists and the researchers are, are telling the truth as far as uh, the dinosaurs and the dis different periods of history, it could be possible. And there's one guy in particular who uh, was really, uh, he shocked people. He was a researcher, a dinosaur scientist. His, his job was specializing in identifying dinosaur species. Can you give me a moment? My dog wants to go outside. He's quiet sure. at me. I'll be back. It's fascinating, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Have you been watching the chat? Uh, off and on, yeah. Uh, these guys are joking right now. Dean's dude said a minute ago, he says he's thinking about um, uh, uh, starting a, um, he said it, he's thinking about a dating ad. Horny tinfoil hat man searching conspiracy girl. Interest in chemtrail watching and false flag preparing. <laughs> I and, love it. And then, um, <laughs> and then, um, Blue Blood says, uh, enjoys evening walks by the psyop drill hoaxes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Dean's dude, um, you could go over to, um, 
Can you could go over to George Norrie's uh, dating website. What's that called? Um, um, he just recently I did, started. I didn't know he had one. Yeah, he, he yeah he does. He started it about a year or so ago. Um, a conspiracy date or something like that. Huh. Paranormal paranormal date. That's what it's called. Paranormal date. Yeah, Deans, go over to paranormal date. You'll find the girl you're looking for. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. Um. So, uh, what were we talking about? We were talking about dating conspiracy-minded people. We were just joking around. I was just reading some of the comments in the chat box. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, what we're talking about as far as like the conversation we were having before the uh, the different species on the planet. I mean, oh, they're dinosaur guy. Okay, this guy he's he's named species of dinosaurs in for the for the history books for the mm -hmm. science books. Um, he's discovered uh, classifications uh, for dinosaurs, so he was a pretty big guy in that in that particular part of of uh, science. And uh, one day he started theorizing um, the what would happen if the evolutionary stream continued on with uh, from the, like the raptors who were you know uh, upright two legs two arms like a t-rex smart you know they were smart what would happen if the evolution kept going in that direction what well, what kind of a a creature would it be and uh you know uh, when it, if its brain capacity increased um if it started uh, living in communities with buildings uh you know so he actually designed for his he had a museum uh he actually designed what he thought it would look like and it like a reptilian or an extraterrestrial or something i mean it, it looked like maybe a very large a very tall and very green gray alien um and i thought well maybe there's a you know maybe there's a maybe there's something to all of that maybe at one time on the earth it was populated by bipedal upright intelligent reptiles that were smarter than um the what we've been, bear. yeah smarter than what we've been told Smart. so could be could be I mean, David Icke talks about that a lot, and I'm not sure uh, how much of it's true, but I think it's interesting. Yep. Because of uh, my research. But I don't think that that means automatically, sort of like Yoda, when when you first meet Yoda in the Empire Strikes Back story for Star Wars, you're thinking, ooh, who's that evil little le lizard guy? It turns out he's, you know, the best guy in the whole story. So you never know. You know what I mean? What you're Looks gonna... can be deceiving. Exactly. Exactly. I don't. I don't think that um, we could assume right off the bat that something that doesn't look like us is necessarily good or evil. But um, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that the stories in the Old Testament about God are all about one guy. I think that some of them are about Enlil. Some are about Enki, and some are about Anu. And you think it's all the same guy, but it's not. It's not all the same guy. There are some points when it's Enki, and there are some points when it's Enlil, and there are some points when it's Anu. And, oh, and here's the piece de resistance. You want to add this other name to Enki's list? I think he was Jesus. You think Enki was Jesus? Yes, he has all of the hallmarks of it. All of them. He's a um, son of Anu, meaning he's a son of God. He's a, Anu was the head Anunnaki. He was the father of Enlil and Enki. And yep. everything, everything Enki says sounds just like things Jesus but says. Weren't Enki and Enlil brothers? Well, technically speaking, um... Yeah, but uh, according to the okay, let's when you're reading the stories about Jesus, when it talks about stuff like um, who do you say that I am, and they say things like, "Well, you're the son of the of the living God," and he says, "You're right," but you know, 
that he's he's not talking about it's that's why there's like this big argument between people who say that Jesus is not God because he's the son of God not God and that humans are also called sons of God so how can uh, Jesus be a God if he's just the son of God and so there's all of this debate over that but if you follow it along really closely you realize that what he's saying he's saying he is the creator which is different than the guy who's in charge of the planet. Well, didn't Jesus also say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Yes, he did. W which, tra which you know, I take to mean that they're the same thing. No, I take it to mean that... The if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Creator. I don't think that Creator, the Father Creator is the same thing as his Father. It, it, you know how he prays. He prays in, in. He's praying to his father in heaven, who is Anu. Okay. Mm, you see what I'm saying? But way it's just the way it's worded, and people. Uh, that does not mean that he's not God. He's the God of the Old Testament. He's just not always the God of the Old Testament. Some parts it's Enlil, and some parts it's Anu. Like uh, when they ask him, "How should we uh, pray?" He says, pray, uh, my, uh, you know, f f our Father who art in heaven. That's Anu. That's not Enlil. That's not well, Enki. Enki's yeah. telling him who to pray to. He's praying to my father. Yes, but is heaven not the sky? Yeah. I mean, ask any five-year-old child, point to heaven. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I understand the whole... It's not necessarily just this guy, though, because if you follow everything that he says, one of the things he says is that it's right here among you. It's right here. You just can't see it. So it's sort of like it reminds me of that episode of Star Trek where a couple of the people on it's the next generation and Jordy and one of the ensigns, a female ensign, are like out of phase from everybody else on the ship. Nobody could see them, but they could see everybody else. And they're talking and waving their hands in front of people so nobody can see them because they're slightly out of phase. But it, to their advantage, they can see everyone else. It also reminds me of this one episode of Carl Sagan's uh, TV show where he's trying to explain the Fourth difference. Fourth dimension. Yes. You got it. I yes. know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, we, so. Someone from the fourth dimension can absolutely perceive the third dimension. It would be like the third dimension can perceive the two dimension, but the two dimension can't perceive the third dimension. Well, they can. It can perceive, but it can't perceive it in total. It can only perceive right, it. right, 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 right. Parts exactly. of it, which right. Is, which is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know, we, or even Paul. He calls them, for now we see in a glass darkly. We're looking at a mirror and we're only seeing a faint image. We can't because it's dark. You know. Um, so if you let me give you an example of how I think all of this plays out. One of the things I learned when I was doing research on the etymology of certain words, I came across this section where it was talking about the Apsu, and it was using a totally different word, Apsu, A-P-S-U. And I was like, what happened to that P? How come that B is now a P? Well, I also noticed that with D's and W's and M's. And I was like, this is dyslexia. All of this, I realized that what had happened was every the writers had a sudden case of dyslexia and nobody could understand each other. You know how it says at the Tower of Babel event that people, they all had the same language. Suddenly nobody could understand one another. And I was thinking, well, maybe that's the writing they couldn't understand. Yeah, because if you look at it, Abzu became Apsu. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Apsu was the name of the brazen sea, which is a great big metal wash basin out in front of the temple of the Jewish temple of the Temple of Solomon. Great big brazen uh, water pit thing. Uh, you could, they washed in it. The priests washed in it. And it was held aloft by 12 bulls. It was like, why in the Sam Hill are they got 12 bulls holding up this big thing of water? I thought he said it. I thought God said, don't create any, don't carve in the light, don't carve anything in the likeness of anything on the earth, in heaven, or in the waters below. 
Why is he carving bulls to hold up the water basin at the temple? It did not make sense to me until I did, of course, the research on the um, Abzu. It all started to fit together a lot tighter. Um, the, uh, for example, um, you know that, that there's a lot of evidence that the patriarchs of the Old Testament were actually pharaohs. That they were, they were not all of the pharaohs, but some, a few. Are you aware of that? Um, not necessarily in that context. I mean, I, I have an understanding of the heroes, uh, the heroes of old, I, I, various different contexts, but not the way you, you're putting it. No, 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 I mean the patriarchs. I'm talking about, like, David and Solomon and, and uh, Moses and uh, Abraham and all of these, these big names of the Old Testament. A lot of them were pharaohs. Oh, oh, oh! You said pharaohs. Gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. I didn't even hear that correctly. Yeah, I, I didn't quite hear. I it thought you said either. heroes. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, no, uh, yes. Pharaoh. Okay. So I have heard that. I have heard that. Yes, that all the, yeah. the many or uh, most of the patriarchs were pharaohs. I've also heard that Jesus was a pharaoh. But you know, I'm, I hold to. I hold to the astro theology angle when it comes to all of the characters of the Bible. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that um, at least all of the main characters, like for example Moses, uh, there was his name. He's actually named after Amos, A H M O S E, who was a pharaoh uh, during the Hyksos expulsion. Yeah, Moses was absolutely a pharaoh. I mean, we the, the Egyptians even have a Tut Moses. No, I, I didn't say that that he was a pharaoh. I was saying that um, he was named after a pharaoh. Uh, he was the, raised in the house of the pharaoh, and the later pharaoh named Amos. Hmm, uh, okay. Why were they all get this most thing on there? That's actually um, the. Uh, the god Ea, or I, uh, they spelled it I A. Uh, the Sumerian or Mesopotamian spelled it E A. Uh, that's Enki. Ea is how you pronounce it. Yes. <laughs> and if you go to the, um, if you go to the, that's what his name means. Can you believe that? I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Go ahead. That's what Sorry. his name. That's what his name means. Oh, say that again. I was coughing. Sorry. Uh, son of Ea, son of Ea. That's what his name means. That's the, what... the god Ea. The god Ea. And then uh, the, one of them is Amos is either the god Ea or the son of the god Ea. And, the other, and then Moses is I think Amos is the son of the god Ea, and then Moses is the god Ea. So why would Moses be called Enki? Why would Moses be called Enki? Yeah, because Enki is Ea. You knew that. E-A, that's Ea. I'm going to write that down because I've got Ea on my list. I don't have Moses anywhere on these lists here. Well, if you go back to the Hebrew, uh, are you ready? Uh, I'm listening. Go ahead. Okay. If you go back to the Hebrew, um, like for the word uh, uh, become or was, uh, any of those to be, you know, that to be or not to be, bad idea. Uh, who, what, who, did, who did God say was to Moses at the burning bush? Um. I don't know uh, what these. I do know this. Uh, you probably take me too long to remember. We're getting near the end. Go ahead, just fill us I, in. I am. I am that I am. Mm -hmm. So I was, okay. If, uh, if you go back to the original language for that, it's hey ya, Asher, hey ya. I was like, why is there three words there that are hey ya, hey ya? Why is it saying that? Well, if you go to the original. Uh, language for the word Elohim, it's Heya. And I was like, why do they keep calling this guy Heya? But Jehovah is Heya. 
not Elohim, but for Jehovah, it's Heya. So I think that that um, Yahweh is Heya. This is uh, Eya. That H is the uh, gender prefix that the uh, Hebrews put up H on the beginning. So it was H to show it was male Eya. Oh, okay. That's yeah. good to know. Yeah, so these are all interconnected and in all of the so the ancient Egyptians were actually worshiping Yankee. And there's a video on YouTube on that subject that there, you know, it says it shows a picture of some sphinx or really elegant looking sphinx with a man's pharaoh's face and it's claiming that uh, this was uh, Enki ruled Egypt and he was the original a pharaoh a long time ago very long time way before um, the dynastic Egyptians um, which I thought was an interesting theory I mean it was, he also called him the serpent though and that wouldn't be accurate I, you know DNA is the serpent and it says in the it says in the Bible that when mankind finally gets to see the devil, the serpent, they really, you're going to say that? That created all this havoc and destruction on the planet? That caused all of the wars? And, and, yep, that's what did it did. <laughs> because it makes us tribal. It makes us uh, protective. It makes us hunters it makes us aggressive it makes us murderous it makes us jealous and everything that's considered a quote-unquote sin it's just a, um, a behavior related to procreation all of those things are to protect the species so why were we being punished because we were displaying behaviors that protected our species uh, you know what I mean? I mean, if we're in a fight for our lives and and we're living well, on well, they didn't planet, want that many of us, right? Apparently not. They still don't. <laughs> that doesn't sound like it, does it? Well, you know, they're talking about overpopulation on a planet that could support easily a thousand times the number of us here. Yep. Uh huh. Sure could. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. If you get a chance, though, really. But we, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If I get a uh, chance, go ahead. Yeah, you need to go in there and check what's the difference between the first Adam that's created male and female. Not saying it's created hermaphrodite. The Adam is a plural word. It's it got the M at the end. That means there's more than one. Some are men and some are women. And they're created in the image of Elohim, which is a plural word. If you go back to the original language, it will tell you that, that there's an option. They can make it a singular word or they can make it a plural word. Why did they pick the singular? Because they were sticking with the idea that God is one God, not a bunch of gods. Um, so obviously, uh, but if that's true, then that means God's a hermaphrodite because he made some male and some female uh, people. People that were part male, part female. That's not what it's saying. I mean, are lizards hermaphrodites? I'm not saying we are lizards. Or we're um, lizards, no. But I understand that frogs under certain conditions can change their sex. And I think, uh, what are the, those little uh, water lizards? I can't remember their name. Um, right on the tip of my tongue. Turtles. <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're air-breathing, um, and they're also water-breathing. Uh, and they look like a little lizard. They're shaped like a lizard. Salamander. Just, salamander. Yes, yeah, salamanders and, <laughs> and frogs can all can so when they're in an environment where there's only one of a uh, particular gender that they can spontaneously change their gender. That's what I've heard. I'm sorry. That's what I understand. Yeah. Thank you, greatest potential. It is salamanders. So I've heard that salamanders and frogs. So amphibians and a salamander is actually both. <laughs> Um, but uh, well, you you're back, asking me. You're the, you asked the question: Are are lizards hermaphrodites? And yeah, if you go back, the only the only closest answer I could come up with is that amphibians, frogs, and salamanders have not been known to change their sex. Okay, uh, if you go back to the Sumerian statuary, um, all of them look like lizard people. All of them do. And I, I was like, this is disturbing. And there was a lot of them that were iconography where there was this 
uh, reptilian chick eating a baby, breastfeeding a baby. I'm like, wait, reptiles have breasts? That's weird. Uh, <laughs> and she's feeding a baby, and the baby looks like a little E.T. as well. I mean, it's a straight. Do you see that movie, Enemy Mine? Oh, yeah. Yes. That's what it reminded that little boy, that little wizard boy. That's what it reminded me of. As a matter of fact, that whole scene at the end of the movie when Davich goes to the the home planet of this guy and says his his family lineage, you know, as part of the tradition of him uh, passing on, and and uh, so that the little boy is christened into his family of uh, uh, Drax. Uh, <laughs> That's what it reminded me of. It reminded me of the Bible and that part where he's talking about all the people. Because if you ever read the, the tenth uh, chapter of Genesis, it's so and so begin so and so and so and so be and peace start yawning. Uh, yes. Yeah. But if you follow it, you find out these people actually re repopulated the entire planet if you follow the the concept that this is talking about the the people that re-inhabited the earth after the destruction, the cataclysm, that's mentioned in the second verse of Genesis. It's the same story. So there's two flood accounts in Noah's flood account. One that was a huge cataclysm that destroyed the planet that was more than just a flood. It was a global catastrophe. And the other one, um, uh, which is just a, a very bad flood, but it wasn't global. It was, you know, the, they, they got, according to these geologists, what happened was, these Oxford guys, they say, okay, what happened was, the Mediterranean Sea, on many times in the ancient past, has been completely dried out. The Nile River would have flowed down into it like a waterfall. Many times over, that's been completely dried out, and what's happened is the water levels have lowered, the sea levels have lowered, until the Straits of Gibraltar there a form like a barrier, uh, like a flood wall, against the ocean. And then eventually that all dries up and it becomes a valley. And this has happened many times in the past. They know this from the sediment when they do their pores, where they drill down and they pull it back up and they look at where the salt layers are versus the dry layers and so on and so forth. So they can tell the history of the geology of the area. And so they figured out from their research that what happened was on one of these times where it had completely dried out, um, the water busted through the Atlantic Ocean must have risen high enough that it broke through the Gibraltar Strait. And it shot down and filled up the Mediterranean Basin and it kept going out the other end through the Bosporus Strait into the Black Sea doing uh, over 100 miles an hour. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, about 100 times more water than flows over Niagara Falls. It was shooting through the Bosporus Strait at 100 miles an hour. Well, now, what would cause that? 100 mile per hour water flow in one direction? Um, Holy shit. All right, French. 100 miles an hour? <sighs> you know, the only thing that would cause that would be um, an asteroid, you know, some explosion in the ocean that would cause that kind of energy and that kind of motion. You know, even a strong gradient, like straight down a mountain, it, it, water just isn't going to flow that fast. Water will not move at 100 miles an hour, as far as I know. And, and if I'm wrong, then I'm, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been wrong once before. Yeah, well, they're claiming it was shooting out the other <laughs> end at over 100 miles an hour. It was shooting out the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. So you come in from the Strait of Gibraltar into the, the Mediterranean Sea, and up the other end is the Bosporus Strait, which is a little body, a little area that, you know, when the water is drawn down, um, it forms a, a, a wall, like a flood wall, on that side of the Mediterranean. That's how come it's managed to become a valley several times, a dried out valley several times in the history, geological history of the area. So the water comes in. It's almost got to cause that water to go that fast. I'm thinking it might be something like a heavy, heavy uh, rock falling in the water, like an asteroid or a meteorite or 
Yeah, because, I mean, even if you observe, like, some of the tallest waterfalls in the world, where water has an opportunity to fall straight down, and it ha doesn't have to go over rocks and get turbulent, um, what happens is that it ultimately turns into tiny droplets because it has to interact with the air at that speed. Yeah, well... The air just blows it apart. In the epic of Gilgamesh, no. that, that is called the flood weapon. Okay, well, it's pretty easy to make a flood weapon. You make an explosion in the ocean, and all the beaches get washed out. And in this case, you know, it washed through the Strait of Gibraltar and, and, and down through that valley. There, there is still evidence today that the, the currents are all heading towards the Bosphorus Strait. They're talking about the geology uh, that would have been an echo from the ancient time when that was shooting in that direction along from the west to the east and out the other end. Um, you could put like a, a thing in there and it'll just pull right along toward, you know, how currents will pull you along gently in the direction. At um, least. Yeah, I do whitewater ca kayaking and I know exactly about currents. <laughs> yeah, you know how the, you could put that I mean, little. First hand. You, you know how you could put that little thing in the water and it'll kind of pull you along. I'm trying to think what they called it. It's the a rudder, the paddle? No, no, no. It was a device I mean, a device that they were using. Probably, uh, they were trying to theorize, I think, at the time, if the Epic of Gilgamesh was talking about an actual event, uh, what was it talking about? And so there were odd little odd things that are mentioned in the story, like the... Uh, the, oh, there's a word for it, and I can't think of the name of it, but it's got something to do with these little uh, devices. And the, the theory they had was that it, it was something you put in the water uh, for your boat. <sighs> Shoot. Nah, never mind. Okay, um, you, you got me lost on that one, too. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at it. It's There's so much information in my head. Uh, the only other thing I could think of on... And, and what's it supposed to do exactly? Oh. I mean, there are chines. There's a, a word called chine, which basically means it's either a protruding or, or either a concave or a convex groove running lengthwise down a boat. And that helps keep the boat straight. No, oh, they were talking about some of the, the... There was an argument between the mainstream... Um, a geologist and these guys were both mainstream geologists too but they were uh, theorizing what's the the flood of the epic of Gilgamesh an actual real event and so they they came to the conclusion that it was um, the Black Sea flood which wasn't global but it was bad enough that the people who lived around like the king of Sumer yeah to you if you live there it would be global enough yeah, you uh, and everybody you know and everybody you ever heard of got washed out. Yeah, really. <laughs> like they show an, a little uh, recreation of what they think it might have looked like. The king of Sumer had all of his bar royal barnyard animals put on a barge and floated, uh, you know, uh, so they wouldn't get washed away. And uh, this is not the same story as the event that's global, which is what causes the ice age which is what the earth is recovering from in the second verse of Genesis. So when I look at the Bible, I see a history book. I see a history book with a lot of secret information in it that is either uh, deliberately uh, masked or um, occasionally misinterpreted or some, sometimes confused, but that it's all accurate. Like, accurate in the sense of these events actually took place. But did they take place in the exact, in a, in a linear time frame? I don't think so. I don't think it's like one event comes right after the other event comes right after the other. It's not always one. It's, if you've read the Mesopotamian writing, for example, they'll tell the story, and then they'll tell the story again with different details. But you'll know it's the same story because the refrain will be the same. And some of the... the lead-ups will be the same. And then they'll add a little more information each time they re retell it. So I think that's what we got going on there. We got them telling the story of the cataclysm and then telling the story of the cataclysm again 
with more details or different details. And then... How do you suppose that happened? What happened? Well, first, why are they retelling the story and why are they changing the story? They're not changing it. They're adding to it. That's still changing it. Okay. Why uh, couldn't they get it right the first time? Why do they have to tell the story several well, times? If you look, if you read, if you've read Sitchin, which I I think you have, haven't you? The Earth Chronicles. I I've not read Sitchin. Okay, well. I've heard about all kinds of things that he read and wrote and said, mm -hmm. uh, but no, I've not personally read Sitchin. Well, he he put it this way. He said that the stories of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, are super condensed version of history so these first people when you're reading the when you're reading the account okay it's sort of like me telling you so okay i'm going to talk to you about what's happening um in in the hospital room i'm going to give you know i'm have i'm going to give birth and i'm going to have kids and this is going to happen and that's going to happen but hopefully and then uh later I tell you the story of what actually happened while I was there, even though I thought, well, this is what's going to happen. Now, I'm not saying that's how it's done. I'm probably confusing this. Uh, okay, they're, the first time they tell the story, they're more focused on the creation event. The second time they tell the story, now they're telling you what happened, how bad it was, what, who survived it, where they went, and essentially... Uh, they went everywhere. They they rehab they re-inhabited the east, the west, the north, and the south up from that area. They re-inhabited the planet. But when you if you pay close attention, you also notice that there's a lesser flood in there, a lesser flood account where thirty two animals were put on the ark. There so. So are they retelling the same story or are they telling different stories all the way through? There is two flood accounts or two cataclysms. One is a not so bad flood, although like you said it would be bad to them. Um, but that would have been a Black Sea flood. And that's where some of the spirit accounts come from, is that event. Uh, and then there was the one that was global. The one that was so bad that you know there they would have had to evacuate the planet for anyone to survive it. And I mean, I, theoretically, if it, has, if, if it wipes out, like when they, when they talk about the Ice Age and what they theorize caused the Ice Age, they say it was an extinction event. It, it wiped out all the dinosaurs. It wiped out the woolly mammoth. It wiped out, you know, all this stuff. I mean, all these species were completely wiped. I can kind of see how that would happen. I'm trying to imagine, you know, the time when obviously there wasn't, you know, airplanes and automobiles. People didn't get around that quick. Um, horses were pretty fast, but, you know, unless you're a Pony Express all the way, you're not. You what, so what do you mean? I'm so to what I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to express a fairly large thought in terms of, understanding why they would have told that same story so you know several times uh, adding to it perhaps and um i can imagine l surviving like say an enormous flood like a meteor hits an ocean and it washes 300 miles inland and maybe i live 301 mile inland and i survive it and i see it we well, just barely escaped you know got our toes wet but we're okay well, and, and, they, then, and then as you as the water recedes, it would take a long time first for it to recede, and then it would take a long time for you, your friends, your family, your children to eventually start wandering to see, did Aunt Martha make it? She lived over the hill. Did my cousin so-and-so make it? He lived two mountain ranges over. And then you go visit someone you know, or you go and trade with a, a, a tribe of people that you know that live way over there in the direction the water came, and you realize they're not there. And then you walk back, and maybe that's a three-week round trip or a three-month round trip. And so new information comes in slowly, and people venture farther and farther, only to realize these guys are all dead. There's no one left. Everywhere we go, there's nothing left. The buildings are gone. There's nobody around. Mm -hmm. We don't even see any freaking animals. 
Yeah, so what... You know what I mean? So these stories would come back slowly over time. Mm -hmm. Now, the, this, the, that could be the Black Sea Flood. That's a possibility. But the one... There's two of them there. There's one that's not so bad where you only need to evacuate 32 farm animals. And the other one where the your whole planet has to be re-terraformed, basically. Well, what's even more interesting, I think, is that for one of those floods, they knew it was coming. There's all kind of language and all kind of different cultures that express knowing that it was coming. It was on the way. In fact, most of these gigantic ancient monuments, the big megalithic stones, the cycloptic structures, the the trilithon, you know, the gigantic blocks of stone that they put the trilithon together, the pyramids, that they were built specifically to survive the next cataclysm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people even tried to go as far as to say that they believe that the flood event happened during the time of Akina. Uh, uh, but during the time of what? Akhenaten. Akhenaten? Yes. And uh, or, or, who was the pharaoh that built that dam around the city? Well, wall all the way around the city so no water could get in. Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> build that, build that ark, build that ark. Um, okay, yeah. Shoot. Um... Yeah, we got to wrap this up. So, are you are you looking that name up? And what name? The name you were just trying to remember. The guy that built the wall around oh, the city. Oh, the Egyptian pharaoh that did that. No, I wasn't. Do you want me to? Oh, I thought I heard you typing. I thought no, you, no, you might no. have been looking it up real quick. No, I. Uh, if I think of it, I'll put it in Skype for you. Okay. I, I have a lot more information in my head. Of course, this could go on for another. Yeah, three, we could. Four days. It sounds like <laughs> it sounds like we could go on till tomorrow, yeah. at least. Yeah. Well, are, I think I think maybe what we should do is think about having you on again in you know a month or so. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Speaking of that. Um, we're we're going to be off for a few weeks here, right? Yeah. Um, starting next week, uh, it'll be a couple of weeks before we do another show. Ian is having a whole lot of hard times at home. And uh, as a contractor, I'm getting real busy because it's springtime and I'm just exhausted and I'm working out of town a lot. I, I don't have hardly any time or much energy to do any research. And we don't have any major guests on the next upcoming list. Ian really needs some time to himself to take care of his wife and uh, straighten out his job position situation. So we're going to take a chill for a couple of weeks, and we love everybody that is supporting the show and all the people that have been hanging in the chat box tonight, Blue Blood and Greatest Potential and Dean's Dude and uh, Sarah and who else was in here? Thelma Lewin. Um, uh, God, I'm just screw that name up. I'll have to scroll way up to see it. Just want to say thanks for everybody that's been in here. Undefeated Champ made it in here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for supporting what we're doing. Amy, um, Beth, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. You're welcome. That was fun. It was a real pleasure hanging out with you. Yeah, it was fun. It Any was. final thoughts, anybody? Uh, Not. Alpha Thelema. Thanks, Alpha Thelema. Who's Alpha Thelema? Alpha Thelema was the name I was trying to remember. The big P99, Baron Fun. Yeah, all the people in our chat box. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just shouting out people in the RT was in there. Just saying hello and thanks to the folks in the in the uh, Dean's chat box. Blue Blood, I see big P99 Blood's came Blood. in early and didn't say anything after that. <clears throat> Big P99 tick likes to show up in my uh, messages, my private messages, and give me the heads up on the latest goings on. So I appreciate uh. the Big P99 feeding me information on occasion. And of course, my buddy Juxtapose. Big shout out to Blue Blood. And I uh, love you guys. Greatest potential. Yep. Uh, love you all. Holy crap. What a loaded question. What? 
Uh, blue, uh, blue Blood Guitar says, Jay, good show. How old are the pyramids? Um, how about another show? Yeah, wow. Yeah, really. Right, we'll, we'll, go there. we'll go there some other time. <laughs> yeah. Blue, uh, Jay, I don't know. I don't know if you were in. Did you come in early on? Because we were, we did cover a little bit of stuff in Egypt about the granite concrete and stuff like that. So if you missed that in the beginning of the show, um, we kind of went on and rambled on. I did at least about the uh, granite. Yeah, you were here early. You heard it. No, but we didn't get to the pyramids per se. Oh, yeah. That, oh, my goodness. There's so much information. Oh, yeah. There's just no shortage of stuff to talk about on this subject. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be glad to have you back sometime soon. Okay. And everybody, send some love Ian's way. Just think about Ian and put him in your thoughts. And with that, I'm going to say thanks, everybody, and good night. Good night. As as, night. As as love as I, you all. Love always. As soon as I get to my other page. All right, you guys. Bye-bye. Love to all. See you guys. Bye.